Welcome to the Lounge Lizards podcast presented by Fabrica 5. It's so good to have you here. It's a leisure and lifestyle podcast founded on our love of premium cigars, as well as whiskey, travel, food, work, and whatever else we feel like getting into. My name is Gizmo. Tonight, I'm joined by Senator, Pagoda, Chef Ricky, and Bam Bam. And our plan is to smoke a cigar, drink some tequila, talk about life, and of course, have some laughs. So take this as your 155th official invitation to join us and become a card-carrying lounge lizard. Plan to meet us here once a week. We're going to smoke a Cuban cigar tonight, share our thoughts on it, and give you our formal lizard rating. We discuss the current Cuban electricity crisis, Pagoda's experience navigating it firsthand on the ground, and what this all means for future travel to Cuba and for the Cuban people, all among a variety of other things for the next two hours. So sit back, get your favorite drink, light up a cigar, and enjoy as we pair G4 Tequila Blanco Madera with the Porro Arniaga Phoenix Edición Regional Phoenicia. A 109 tonight on the pod from Cuba. It's the Por Arniaga Phoenix Edition Regional Phoenicia. And it's a 50 ring gauge cigar by seven and one quarter inches long. And boys, we have a very interesting episode ahead of us tonight. Oh, yes, we do. We have a lot to discuss. And in our hand is a cigar that has the shape of one of our favorites, the 109. Correct. With the Bellicosa head on That's it. That's right, yeah. Substantial cigar. Very substantial cigar. But it doesn't feel... No, it's not dense. It doesn't feel very dense in the hand. Yep. Toothy, pretty ruggedly handsome wrapper. Very rugged. I'm yeah. getting a little barnyard on the... Yeah, that's yeah, for sure. Probably all I'm getting. On the foot. A little cedar, maybe. I get a lot of sweet notes on the wrapper. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I don't like know dessert. if that's me or the uh, the cigar or whatever the hell's in the room right now. Yeah, there is a potpourri no. aroma yeah, going around. There's here. an oil diffuser that's on yeah. right now that yeah. I don't get usually. All right, boys, let's cut this thing. See what we're getting on the cold draw on the wrapper. Now, did you guys get this in Cuba? Mm. Mm. The cold draw is delicious. It's surprising how r- raisin forward it is for me. Mine is very cedar and dry. Mm-mm. A little yeah. dry fruit. No fruit at all. Very little. Right the, now, I'm there with Giz a little bit. I'm I'm kind of getting cereal notes and some on the sweeter side. Yeah, I get a lot of nuttiness. Nutty. I was gonna say dry. almond. Like yeah. a lot. Yeah. That's what I'm. Yeah, maybe almond. Almond. Yeah, mm. but the draw is wide open. Mm. Maybe I need a slightly deeper cut. Nice, All right, boys. Nice cold draw. Let's light this thing. The Port Warnaga Phoenix, the Edition Regional for Phoenicia. Again, it's a 50 ring gauge 109 by seven and one quarters inches long. The box code on this is BRM October 23. It came out of the La Corona factory, which is appropriate for our discussion tonight. Do we know what these are going for? The original retail price on these cigars was $48. Yeah, was that? On the secondary market now, or places like Bond, Bond Roberts, you're probably going to find them somewhere between 75 and 95 a stick. Jeez. Wow. So they've pretty much doubled since their initial release. Safe to say it's a ultra premium product, mm-hmm. that price. Delicious on the light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very pleasant. Um, it's mm. great on the retrohale, too. Very woody, though, on the light, mm. mm-hmm. which is characteristic of Port Laranaga. It's actually one of the things I don't really love about the marca. But um, I was hoping it would be sweeter just because I got a lot of nuttiness on the cold draw, some of those dessert notes on the wrapper. But, man, it's very woody. It's funny. Now, for me, I'm getting a lot, a ton of nuts. A ton yeah. of nuts. No dry fruit, but I'm, get, I'm definitely getting some almonds. There's a little. sweetness in the background that I'm getting. Yeah. Touch of something. Could be honey. Could be like a sweet cream, maybe. Mm-hmm. Construction is great. I mean, yeah. effortless combustion. Mm-hmm. Retro is delicious. And I, you know, we've talked about this be- before with cigars of this size. I don't know if we've actually ever done a 109, a full format 109. We did the Petite 109 correct. from Bond Roberts. I, this, I think this is our actual first 109 on the pod. I just love That's correct. how these feel in the hand. It's a great, great you know, cigar. It's, it feels elegant. It feels yeah. sophisticated. Mm-hmm. It feels significant. And I like when you have a cigar of this size that, that it doesn't feel overpacked or dense. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't feel too weighty. Yeah. I agree with that, but I will say the the size, it, I mean, it, it's kind of imposing like a Churchill. Oh, yeah. Oh, it like, definitely is. Yeah, you see this and you're like, okay, I, I got to have some serious time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's developing nicely already. Just maybe after the fourth or fifth draw now. So, boys, we have an interesting episode ahead of us tonight. This is the first time in 
kind of crazy coming up on three years in November here. This is the first time on the podcast tonight. We are recording an episode on Monday night. So tonight is October 21st. We're recording this and it will be, this episode will come out tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. Simply because we have had a wild experience, namely Pagoda, but the rest of us as well, with the chaos that has happened in Cuba. Yeah. With the power outage, and it aligned, uh, it actually aligned well for us getting out of there, and for Pagoda, did not align well. Unfortunately, with him staying back with his friends for a few days, yeah. so he could show them Havana. Uh, but it it has turned into a real humanitarian crisis in Cuba, so we have a lot to discuss on that topic tonight. So this is the first time we're recording on a Monday night, and this will be out in eight hours or so. Pretty serious topic. Yeah, very serious. Yeah. So our normal lizards in Cuba recap episode that we would do when we come home from Cuba, we we you know we we haven't actually discussed it yet. We're probably going to push that off or forego it entirely, you know, due to the horrible situation going on in Cuba. If you're unaware, if you're uninitiated, what's going on? There's been a complete failure of the electrical grid in Cuba. It's been all over world news uh, in some format or another, and it failed on Friday morning. I guess what pagoda around. 11 or 12, 11 a.m., 12 p.m.? Yeah, yeah, around, uh, it, was, it was in the morning sometime, yeah. yeah. And it failed across the entire country, which is pretty significant. You know, if you think about Cuba, it's the biggest island in the Caribbean, 10 million people on the island. And to think that every single person is without electricity and, and what happens because of that, uh, it's a real, real catastrophe and a real problem sure. for people. So... We, um, we're going to discuss that quite a bit tonight. We're going to talk about Pagoda's experience being there without power and what that looked like. But, you know, just a general kind of update as of this recording right now, which is around 8, 8.20 p.m. on Monday night, the 21st, apparently about 90% of Havana has some power at this time. Most of the rest of the island is still without power and probably will be for some time, which is terribly unfortunate. And of course, as I mentioned, it's leading to a serious humanitarian crisis because not only not having electricity in your home to power the things you need and keep your phone charged and keep you know, your, your home moving, but it's, it's really the biggest problem is the spoiling of food. And fresh water. And fresh Access water. Access to fresh water. And fresh water. The pumps that yeah. pump this water through the city are unable to run with ele- without electricity. So what it's done is taken a, a country and uh, a society that's already so strapped and has added another level of incomprehensible suffering on them. And, and we're talking about the people outside of Havana, the people in rural areas of Cuba who don't have very much, who don't know what they're going to eat every day. And this is going to affect them for, mm-hmm. I can't imagine how long, Yeah, you know, so... It's, uh, it's, it's very, very unfortunate. But uh, So we're going to go in and out of the cigar with this discussion. We do have a tequila we're going to do tonight. So it's going to be a little bit different of an episode uh, in light of what's going on, but uh, we're going to do our very, very, very best. So what do you guys think about the cigar right now? It's nice. I'm getting a lot of almond and walnut mm. with, I'm not going to say cedar, but it's almost like an oaky type of um, background. It's inter- It's interesting. I haven't had a cigar like this ever before. I agree with the walnut. For me, it went from like almond and a somewhat sweeter nut to like a drier, more Mm -hmm. walnut, oaky flavor. Um, Again, this for me is very characteristic of this marca, but it's it's still not really my ideal, you know, mix of flavors. Well, the PLPC, that's a Corona. It's a yeah, Petit Corona, completely different profile. That I get a lot of. For me, it's the kind of like a quintessential Cuban. I do get graham cracker, a little honey. I get cedar. It's sweet. It's a little savory and sweet. That I love. That I, um, I still get many of these notes in that exact cigar. In this cigar, in the PLPC, in that. Particular oh yeah, one. yeah. I, I still get one. that woodiness. I still yeah. get the walnut. The uh, sweetness I, here is completely evaporated. It's evaporated. Yeah, yeah, in this for sure. But still kind of pleasant, I have to say. Not a bad cigar right now. It you know it gives me like it's it's really interesting. I don't know how to describe it, but I thought that when you know they put like almond extract in food, there sometimes can be that slight bitterness associated with it. It's, it's a pleasant bitterness. It's mm-hmm. not, but it's got this flavor. I think 
that flavor is just coming through for me. Yeah, for me, it's it's it is it did go complete wood on me. Lots of uh, like I I, I guess you guys are saying walnut because it feels kind of tannic for me, mm. right? Um, but there is a savoriness that lingers on my lips, uh, from the cigar. But something you know, maybe it's slightly salty. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it is kind of dry and and walnutish right now for me as well. So just some quick backstory on the cigar, uh, just briefly. So this is an edition regional, like I said, for Phoenicia. Phoenicia is the exclusive distributor of Habano cigars in Cyprus and in the Middle East. And the cigar was announced in 2021, celebrating the 15th anniversary of the relationship between Habano SA and Phoenicia, the distributor. The cigars were finally released in December 23. Uh, it was a very limited run. They come in numbered slide lid boxes of 15 cigars with 6,666 produced only. So it's a limited release. And so this cigar came out in December 23, announced two years prior, as we said. The original 15 count boxes were about 660 euros, which is somewhere around $48 a cigar. So like I said, they've about doubled in price now on the secondary market. It is interesting. And why I pulled this tonight is a factor of three reasons. Number one, this episode came together very quickly with what's happened over the past weekend that we'll talk about. So I didn't have time to kind of plan it out. We recorded an episode that was supposed to come out tomorrow, weeks ago, two weeks ago, before, right before we went to Cuba, just to make sure we had something and it's edited, ready to go. But obviously the situation took a little precedence. So I grabbed these. And then the other factor too is, you know, this is the fifth poor Lauren Yaga we've done on the podcast tonight. And if you guys remember, we did one, I don't know, about 10 or 15 episodes ago, the Picadorus number one, which did not perform well and <laughs> honestly performed. And that's going to be talked about on the end of the end of the mm-hmm. year recap episode. So hopefully we're, we'll have a little bit of redemption tonight for uh, poor Lauren Yaga on the pod. Let's hope this is better meat in a can. <laughs> yeah, I'm really hoping this takes a, a turn into something a little bit sweeter. I don't see it happening. Yeah. It's just super dry. Yeah. Yeah. If if I had known this, I probably would have picked a, a, a Reposado or something. What I'd like is that it could pairing. pair with with the right spirit and yeah. work nicely to help quench that lack of mm. moisture or yep. sweetness and yep. create some balance. We'll see. I agree. I mean, that's why, to Ricky's point, I I think like a darker spirit, yeah, would yeah. really help a cigar like this. You know, you you look at Port Lauren Yaga as a flavor profile, right? You look at what you know about Cuban cigars and and trying to pair that. You know, do you bring in? Do you take the gamble and bring in mm-hmm. a Scotch? Do you take the gamble and bring in a higher, you know, a bourbon that's going to be higher proof? Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm hoping that you know the uh, the, the pairing we have tonight uh, is going to work out. It's interesting with PLPC the. From Vitola to Vitola, there are differences. There isn't the consistency that you get in many other marcas. I, I don't. I really feel differently. I, I don't like the marca very much. I know just you don't because yeah. Yeah. all of them, in some way, shape, or form, have this dry, woody earthiness. I need to get you a Petit Corona out it, of my box. All right. I mean, I'll, I'll see. I've roosters give me several of them, and he know every what he's doing. time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. He's gonna love hearing this tomorrow. Well, he ain't here, so I'm talking. <laughs> Don't have any fighting words. <laughs> but I just feel like even with those, it's not nearly as dry as this. I'm with you there. Yeah. But I just feel like in the background, you still get these same notes, and to mm. me, there's that consistent DNA through all of them, and it's just usually not my cup of tea. So I, I don't pursue the mark as often. Right. A cup of chai would go. Sure. Rooster just perked up wherever he oh, is. Yeah. <laughs> His nipples itch. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Anytime I've heard someone say chai tea since he talked about that, yeah. all I can think about is that they're saying tea, tea. Yeah, titty. Yeah. Titty. titty, yeah. All right, boys. So back to our uh, our topic on hand tonight. So as we mentioned, the entire island of Cuba has been dealing with a major power outage, I guess going on four days now uh, since it all happened leading to probably what is the worst humanitarian situation on the island since at least the special period in the early 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed, likely is even worse than that. 
The real question that, that is up in the air is the long-term stability of the electrical system. And as we know, the problem is food. So let's go back and lay out our experience here from the beginning. So our plan was to go for about a week. Uh, Pagoda was going to come in a little bit later than us and stay a little bit later and kind of show his friends around Havana and kind of give them uh, a little bit of the lizard experience there and meet some of our friends and give some stuff away, et cetera. So Senator and Lizard Henry, a friend of ours, arrived on Friday, October 11th. I came in from the Dominican Republic the next day on Saturday the 12th, and then BAM arrived on Monday the 14th, all of us leaving on when, uh, on Friday. excuse me. Pagoda arrived on Wednesday the 16th with his plan to stay, and he was going to stay till what? Uh, the following Wednesday. The 23rd, 23rd, so two days from now. Yeah. yeah. So the first, first things first, I mean, uh, compared to our other times in Cuba when we had been there in the past, the rolling blackouts that were occurring throughout Havana were much more common, I feel, than any other time we had been there. Way more. Like it I was mean, every day. Every single day. Maybe there was one day that was an exception. Yeah. If not every, almost every single day. We lost power from between an hour to four hours of the mm -hmm. day. Yep. And the wild thing is, uh, you know, Lizard Henry and I get there that Friday, then Gizmo shows up the next day. <laughs> and we usually stay in this large uh, house. Um, like a walk-up, a three-four. Yeah, yeah, seven beds, seven baths, a big place. And it wasn't available the entirety of the dates that we needed. So the first two nights we were in the penthouse of this apartment, and then we were moving to the house. And so Gizmo shows up had Saturday. A, had a great workout. This apartment is on the 15th floor, the top floor of this building. And Gizmo's texting, you know, Lizard Henry and I that he's, you know, on his way. He'll be there soon. We're like, okay, great. The time he was texting us, we did have power in this apartment. <laughs> now oh Gizmo shows up <laughs> and the fucking power goes out. He's got to walk up 15 <laughs> flights of stairs. You on the 16th floor? <laughs> I would love to have seen his face. And the funny, the walking funniest, into the apartment. With the luggage? He's <laughs> rubbing his chest as you talk, <laughs> as you say the story. I'm feeling my lungs. The <laughs> funniest part is that the day before, when we, when Lizard Henry and I got there, and the staff at the, at the apartment was warning us about these blackouts and how usually they schedule them, and they're for a few hours during the day, and uh, she said she'll give us a heads up, you know, as much as she gets it. And uh, I think it was Lizard Henry. He's like, you know, just watch somehow like when when uh, Gizmo arrives, like the fucking power goes out. He's going to have to climb up 15 flights of stairs. Fast forward the next day. Are you serious? The timing of it. I mean, as soon as he got to that place. Wow. And he gets up there dripping sweat, <laughs> huffing and puffing. Coming up With his luggage. Flights. He was furious. <laughs> Well, because they're sitting there puffing cigars. Hey, good to see you. Hey. They didn't even know the power went out. <laughs> they didn't even know because they're sitting in the living room in the dark smoking cigars. Oh, it was broad daylight. Yeah, That's why we didn't no know. Idea. Yeah, they didn't know. Wow. So how did you know? Because oh, as he soon knew. As, as, the soon elevator. as soon as I pulled up, the elevator didn't work. And all of a sudden, the housekeeper yeah. shows up like, you have two options. You can go somewhere else or you can <laughs> climb the stairs. Oh, so really? I, yeah, so I climbed the stairs. But, the, you know, it was it was a real change in the fact that not that i have a problem with power outages or climbing stairs per se but it it was unique to arrive in havana arrive to in you know we stay in vedado over by the u.s embassy and it, it was the first time that we had experienced you know a power outage like that and then it continued every day mm -hmm. every day in the afternoon it continued and it was like okay you know there's definitely problems and they they see problems happening they don't have the capacity to serve the city of Havana, they certainly don't have the capacity to serve the country, and it, it you kind of sense something. It just felt a little different, you know. Yeah, like but the this look is in the her eyes. This is the first time, right? Because I think the last few experiences, we've never ever experienced a blackout or even. There have been a out. couple have, outages, but just they've been much shorter is and less frequent. So, like most trips that we were there. The power would go out while we were like upstairs on the roof having breakfast. Mm -hmm. It'd go out for like a half hour, an hour, and then it'd come back. And it wasn't every day. It was maybe just a handful of days out of the trip. True. But this to be every day and for extended periods of time, I mean, it's, it's just crazy. It I mean, different. the fact that the housekeeper at the first place was telling us like, you know, when this happens, you guys are going to need to make the decision. Do you want to just stay in the apartment and wait it out? try to leave in advance of the blackout so you can use the elevator to get down 
or otherwise your option is 15 flights of stairs down and if you come back but, or two but you don't want to take the chance and get stuck in the elevator oh that'd be crazy which is terrifying that's terrifying oh yeah you know it's actually to the point where i probably will never stay at that penthouse again in, not in, probably yeah I mean, we're, we're not talked about that. this we're not doing 100%. every time we were in that elevator and Gizmo had to open his mouth each time and make sure we all knew, can you imagine if we got stuck in this elevator right now? Like, why speak this into existence at this moment? But uh, yeah, it was scary. I mean, we just, you couldn't get it out of your head that, I mean, we're, we're going to call the Cuban fire department and they're going to come in, oh, what, yeah. two days? They'll be I there mean, right away. <laughs> We'd still be in the elevator. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then Lord knows you guys had a ton of sticks on you, so it's not that you could even light a cigar in there because it's so small and all of you. Yeah, there's no airflow. Like, there's the, the, yeah, it's nothing. tiny. I mean, three uh, of us fit in there tight. Fucking torture. You know? Yeah, it would have been. It would have been really bad. I mean, I'm not claustrophobic, really but that there is like no air in that yeah. uh, elevator. It's brutal. No, and just the thought of like, is somebody going to come anytime soon to save us? Yeah, and if even if they do, can they? You know, whereas yeah. they have the tools yeah. to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's like if all three are standing, all their bellies were touching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, man. So the first real kind of high sign to me that there was a problem, like a serious problem, was on Thursday night. I got a, a, a message from a friend of ours who works at one of the factories. And uh, we haven't talked about this person before. It's not anybody we've mentioned, just someone that we know at one of the factories sent us a link to a government-issued statement in Cuba saying that effective Thursday night, October 17th, that all school activities, all non-essential work, and all social activities were going to be canceled effective immediately through the weekend. So Thursday night through Monday, there was to be no school, no non-essential work, and you know, all the clubs and anything non-tourist, bars, anywhere where people congregate was to be closed to limit electrical consumption so that's a pretty big red flag like what what is what's what's to be anticipated here so we continued on with our with our day and we we actually saw some folks at la corona that day which was really nice went over there had a nice time there and and we had a pretty fairly normal thursday day and evening you know it was totally fine so day and evening no, we did not have a normal day. Evening. Day and afternoon. The day evening afternoon. until the time so, of the was yeah. So the, the potential thing with, disaster, right? You know, with these blackouts, the one thing about them, they were always scheduled just during the day. They mm. were never at night. That's correct. Never once at night. And on Thursday night, we go to dinner. We get back to our house, and <laughs> someone we were actually um, it was dropping off some cigars for us. And I, you know, I'm looking at like the patio that's usually lit at this house and it's dark. So I go to like flip the switches and I go, holy shit, the power's out. This never happens at this hour. I mean, this must be like nine o'clock after we've eaten dinner. And for hours we were without power that night, no air conditioning. It's hot. And it was storming. It was storming. It, was, it almost felt like a, like a tropical storm type of wind it, and it rain. It felt like yeah. Armageddon for a moment. Yeah. It, it was, was very yeah. odd. And so that was also another odd sign of just like for the power to be out at night there, like clearly this is not one of these scheduled things. And uh, the duration that it was out, something was obviously off. I remember when the lights came on. <laughs> it was, oh. There was so much jubilation. <laughs> oh, so, we were so, we were so happy. happy. It was, <laughs> we were born again. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, one of the happiest moments. Yeah. That was great. Yeah, it's crazy. Like that Thursday night, I re you know, I remember when we came back to what you're saying and you walk in the house and it's like, it's dark. And, you know, you're thinking about all these people around Havana who might not have power. Like how difficult that is, that, that must be to navigate. You know, if your cell phone's dead and, of and you don't have a lot of stuff in the house, you have little kids in the house. Like, well, that's just how it. challenging that must be for us. It was inconvenient. I'm sorry. It, it was, was inconvenient. It was a walk in a park yeah. compared to what yeah. families are going through. Yeah, um, I can't imagine. Yeah, food spoiling, not having water. Kids are scared. Wind, rain. No security at all. Yeah. I just remember Gizmo. I'm gonna have to pack in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> I was dying. You know why? Because my phone was dead. I'm usually pretty good about charging my phone, and for some reason on Thursday I didn't. I oh, came correct. Back from Your phone was, was dead. Yeah. It was dead. Yeah, uh -huh. it was totally cooked. Well, now you guys know. It takes some solar battery packs. Yeah, oh yeah, we have uh -huh. a whole new set of. We have That's a whole a new agenda. New we'll talk about that a little bit later. So on Friday morning, we woke up. There was power. We were totally good. We left. I guess we left the house about eight thirty for the airport. Uh, the three of us and Lizard Henry. We said goodbye to Pagoda, who was expecting his friends. 
went to the airport. Everything was normal. Went through the airport, got on the plane, and we were on the plane. And then we're on the plane on the Wi-Fi to Miami, and shit hit the fan. The entire country went black. No, no power. Thank God that the Cuban government can't screw up the sunlight right. like they can the electricity. But I mean, the wild thing is it it went it went dark when we were when we had boarded because we boarded right. at eleven a.m. The flight left eleven forty-five. Mm-hmm. It went dark at eleven. But the airport, they had generators, so we had no clue. That's there was right. still yep. power where That's we right. were. Yep. But everyone else was starting to realize, okay, here we go again. So we started panicking because we had left our boy Pagoda <laughs> behind. Our most capable lizard <laughs> in a <laughs> Spanish-speaking country. <laughs> most technically adept. <laughs> and by the way, I had no clue. I went and lit up a cigar upstairs. You were on the this roof. This is the best part. He sent us his selfie from That's the right. rooftop he did send with us a selfie. cigar in his mouth, smiling. He's having a great time. <laughs> oh, and he had only 10% left on his phone, by the way, at that yeah. moment. <laughs> oh, Jesus. No worry in the world. Life is great. You know. <laughs> yeah. So we're on the plane flying back, and then we landed in Miami. It was a short flight, obviously, catching our connection to Newark. And we started reading about this and understanding what was going on. And, and I had talked about that Thursday statement I had seen. Clearly, the government knew this was coming, and it totally turned the entire island off. And it didn't really turn back on until today, Monday. Yeah. You know, uh, which which is crazy, and we'll go through all that th- those details with Pagoda there. But it was out for three or four days from that time that we were on the plane that morning, which is just absolute lunacy. Yeah, it's totally I also, crazy. I also think for context, I, I imagine that someone's got to hear this and say, "Well, like you know, I've been without power for a week when there's a hurricane, things like that." You know, it's one thing when it's weather related and they're actually having to like restore down power lines and things like that, or a blown transformer. This is just this country literally doesn't have the energy that it needs right. to produce enough electricity or to power the resources the country. to produce the power. They right. don't have yeah. the carbon to turn the turbines. Correct. At yeah. the thermonuclear plants. Correct. To provide enough power for thermoelectric. The thermoelectric. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Did I say yeah. nuclear? Yes. I meant thermoelectric. Yeah. Nuclear would be great. But that would be great. Yeah. But I don't think they'd be able to keep it stable <laughs> on that island. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think we're going to allow nuclear there. Yeah. No, the isotopes. The isotopes have to float in cold water, people. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be in cold water. So. We started trying to get in touch with Pagoda, and we're on the plane trying to like conduct like a Navy SEAL operation to first get Pagoda to realize what's going on. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying what's happening. He's sending meantime. selfies. <laughs> Senator and I are like on the plane, he's, rows apart, messaging like, he's using, we got to get him out of there. He's yep. there using the last of his ice in his cocktail. <laughs> exactly. oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. He's <laughs> sipping Havana 7. We were all pretty terrified for him. But we didn't get that reaction from him at all. <laughs> it was you know, ignorance really, is a bliss. <laughs> ignorance <laughs> is a bliss. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But as nighttime fell, we were scared for you. Yeah. No, uh, so it's, we were really terrified. Someone yeah. had to be because he wasn't. That's correct. All right, boys. So let's pause on that for a second. Let's talk about the. We're coming to the end of the first third here on the Port Laranaga, Edicion Regional for Phoenicia, the Phoenix. What's everybody thinking? I'm I'm still pretty woody here, but I will say after I drop my ash, um, I am starting to get the slightest hint of banana notes in here. That's which, pretty fair. Which is giving me some hope that maybe it is going to take a little bit more of a turn, you know, lane shift into something a little bit sweeter. It's smoking better. It's a bit more enjoyable than it was. I'll say that. I actually like how it's developing. Yeah. I like how it started. It was a little too dry. Mm-hmm. There's no question about that. But I like how it's slowly building. It's 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 developing into something that's I think very pleasant. And for a cigar like this, I think it's taking us on a journey, which is of course what we want in a cigar like this. So hopefully it's a two or three act play at least. Are you guys getting that sort of sensation in your mouth, like after consuming tomato juice or something like that? I'm or getting that behind my lips. Thing? Yeah, it's like tannic, but. I don't want to say tannic wine. I don't want to say yeah, yeah. I don't want to say umami because it's not. It's just it's it. There's a certain feeling behind my lips when I run my tongue around. I get that on the finish. Yeah, tannic feeling or flavor profile. Pagoda, what do you think? For me, it's getting you know uh, you know earlier I mentioned I was getting a slight of uh, the almond bitterness uh, you know of an extract. Now that's. 
dissipated. It's become a little sweeter for me. So now it's becoming a lot more pleasant for me. Um, I don't know about this banana, but there is a hint of sweetness. You know, it's moving in that direction. So um, just got to smoke a bit more too. But, you know, it does, you're right, in the sense that it is, it doesn't have a long finish. It's, you know, a little drier. It, it, uh, a lot of it is present in the front towards the lips and uh, the front part of the tongue, I think. What do you guys think of the retro hill? I actually like the traditional draw better. The retro just turned from for me in a really pleasant way. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, I didn't dislike it the first third. Now it's getting a little bit baking spicy. For it, me. That's exactly what it is. It's like a baking uh, s- spice, and there's a little sweetness there for me. I can't wait to get that. That's, <laughs> <laughs> smoke a little faster, man. I will. No, it's. Uh, I, yeah. I, I'm finding it to be pretty pleasant. Maybe, maybe drop your ash and see what happens. Should I? That, that's when. That's when my cigar shifted. Kind of looks because I, I no. I had a pretty good size ash on mine too, but it was. I, All right, let's see what happens. So, boys, while we're paused here on the uh, on the story, let's talk about our pairing tonight. We have G four tequila blanco, and this sorry, is sorry, Puba. <laughs> yeah, now Puba <laughs> perked up. I didn't know you weren't going to be here. <laughs> Hey, do we need ice before we start? Oh, boy. Uh-oh. No, no ice. Oh, all right. Boy. <laughs> so it is slightly high proof. So, all right. So, you know, we're all fans of G4 Blanco. This is G4 Blanco Madera. This is a, a, a limited release that they started. G4 typically ferments their juice in stainless steel tanks without fiber, which is slightly more modern. And, you know, it's still, they're still producing great uh, juice at, at, at the end of the day. But they decided to go a little bit further back in time, and now they're using uh, wooden fermentation vats for this batch of G4 Blanco. So they have an entire line of Madera, which is Spanish for wood, and they have a Blanco Repo, and I believe in Añejo too. This is the Blanco, uh, and they purposefully release it at a slightly higher proof so that the agave shines because they want people to taste the difference. Is it released that cer- during certain times of year, or is it... No, I, I, this is the first time. This is I lot see. number one. I see. Um, so this is the first time. They, I don't know that they did it to you know to line up with anything throughout the year. I just think they wanted to kind of. The go. aroma on the nose is very strong. It's intense. Yeah. It's yeah. very intense. Like it almost burns your nostrils. That word is accurate. Almost here, yeah. literally burns it does. your nostrils. Yeah, it especially does. if you take a really heavy inhale yeah. on it. Yeah. It really burns your no- your nose. And, and there is. Re- remember, uh, guys, to inhale with your mouth open also. Sure. Yeah. Even when I do that, I'm still burning my nose. <laughs> it's good though. It's very good. I um, like the flavor. I like the heat on the on the sip. I'd probably steer more toward having this. I wouldn't have this in the summer. I'd probably have it in the fall. For me, yeah, yeah. No, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, and so, that that sensation when I take that first sip is kind of enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. No, I I love it. First sip, um, you know, it's kind of viscous. It's a blanco, mm-hmm. and it's it's still pretty viscous. Um, and on, I get a little uh, minerality and almost like salted, like a faint salt caramel on the back sides of my tongue. See, I get the opposite. I get that sweet caramel thing on the front and on the mm. back side is the minerality. The minerality lingers on the finish for me. Nice. I like that. It's very nice. And how are you guys feeling with the cigar? How is the tequila pairing for you with the cigar we have tonight? So I have to say... Um, I think the tequila is helping the cigar yeah. tremendously. I agree. Totally agree. For me, the cigar is suddenly creamier yeah. and sweeter. And there's a little saltiness, too. That's uh, exactly the last thing I was going to say. Sorry. Bingo. No, 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 no. You're spot on. Spot on. It's honestly, without this tequila, I was not enjoying the cigar all that much. But with it, it's really, really helped. It Which points help to the merits, you know, the merit of, of a good pairing. Right and 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 finding these in you know interesting things that normally you wouldn't put together, like it's a it's a it's a really interesting play. Mm. What's going on on uh, in our mouths? So it's funny because it, I was originally nervous because it's a blanco, so it hasn't really touched any wood for aging. So in my head, prior to tasting the pairing or the tequila with the cigar, I was thinking that perhaps a reposado would go better. But the wooden fermentation vats here really help. You could really get um, a lot of sweetness out of the agave, but not just like that bright citrus sweetness that a good Blanco typically brings. So I think for me, some of that salt, the caramel and stuff, that's coming from the from the fermentation process and the wooden vats. I think the comment on the spirit Senator made, it's actually pulling out notes that I wasn't getting prior to taking a sip. And that's unusual. I mean, I don't get that very often. This is a pretty interesting pairing. 
I think it works great. Yeah, I think to Bam's point, usually the pairing, at best when it's helping, it will just accentuate mm-hmm. notes that you were just getting faintly. But to your In point- In parallel. Right. Yeah. To your point now, it's just bringing out things I wasn't getting any of before. I, I feel like the, the simplest way that I'm kind of computing what you guys are saying is normally a pairing will push stuff up. Mm-hmm. I feel like this, to, to use the exact word you used- it's pulling it out. It's extracting. It's extracting it from the cigar which on your is palate. Really, a great, a great experience. That's pretty unique for yeah what we do here. Hmm. Yeah, I think we're onto something here, boys. Yeah, so this is a great spirit. Bottle retails for about seventy six dollars. Nice. Um, and you know, G four in general, they're you know they're a legit uh, tequila producer. That's uh, Don Felipe Camarena. So brother to Carlos Camarena, as I said before, anything these guys make, um, you know, they, they do it well. Um, and they took a product that was already delicious and made it even more so by introducing the wooden fermentation process hmm. over the stainless steel. So this is different than the Blanco we had at your For the Love of Agave event? Mm-hmm. That's the standard production. That's the standard production. Blanco, yeah. In stainless steel. Steel. In stainless steel. Okay. And what's the price delta on these two Blancos from G4? Uh, 30 bucks? 20 bucks? No, no. Uh, yeah, 16 to 20 bucks. Not 30 bucks, though. Okay. G4 Blanco is pretty. Uh, like a $55 bottle. Exactly. This is 76. Hmm. Okay, good. Well, this is a nice entry tonight from Agreed. G4, our first on the pod. So mm-hmm. we'll see how, uh, see how it does as this cigar continues along i'm also just encouraged because we talked about the nose is very intimidating on this spirit but the mouthfeel it's it doesn't sip aggressively hot no it's like you know it's strength there's a a bit of a warming quality when you swallow it like bam was saying he would have this more in the fall than the summer but it's not like a harshness or anything that feels overpowering it's It's like just the right amount of strength Yeah, I think, you know, as 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 you get accustomed to drinking agave spirits, this is the next step, right? Like very rarely now, as, as you start to appreciate agave, do you seek like the the, the 40, uh, the 80 proof, you know, tequilas. Now you start kind of uh, diving in a little bit higher, which is why now there's so many high proof releases or still strength, because they realize now that people are really enjoying the actual flavor of the agave without adding water and whatnot. So some other things they do for this tequila, they use a deeper uh, well water source. So that adds to the minerality and some of the depth of flavor we're getting. But other than that, you know, they're using Tejonas. They're, you know, they're doing all the all the awesome stuff. I like the pairing, boys. I do too. And the but, cigar is really starting to pop for me. It is. Pagoda, no ice? How's it working? <laughs> well, he was in Havana with our hey, power, man, he's so he's been, used to no ice he's now. He's been through hell and back, man. All right. <laughs> Listen. This is our own personal MacGyver right here. He's L- been through hell. Listen, you don't need ice if you have a really good spirit in your hand. There oh. you go. All right. Amen Pagoda that, has brother. changed. This yeah. weekend has changed him. This weekend really has. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. There's no he, ice there. He doesn't need ice. He doesn't need electricity, water. He's a simple man these His days. His hair is yeah. a little curlier. His eyebrows are a little bit more furled. He's looking very <laughs> relaxed. Almost sexy, I got to say. He's a different man right now. I like it. I'm still on vacation. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Till Wednesday. 007 meets MacGyver meets Pagoda. I was going to say he's giving me the world's most interesting man well, vibes. Correct. Right yeah. He gave us all that vibe <laughs> for about two days. Oh, dude. So, boys, let's go back. You know, we're obviously we're making light of all this, and uh, it's a tough situation there. So let's go back to what you experienced. So Friday, we're on the plane to Newark. We took off from Miami around 3 o'clock, landing around 7, I guess, or something like that. We were a little delayed. And man, we were all in a state of panic on the plane, not being able to get in touch with you, seeing the messages on WhatsApp not being delivered, not understanding what was going on, hearing from other friends in Havana, reading the news, seeing Twitter. It was really starting to boil very quickly. So I'm curious for you, how did how did the experience start in the afternoon once you kind of started to realize what was going on? So um, let me uh, begin with ignorance, right? Ignorance. I'm over there hanging out, having a drink. Yvonne comes by, having a little chit chat with him. That's the half of our uh, casa, yeah, correct. Trying to pour a drink with him, you know. It's just very relaxed. Then he steps out. I'm hanging out alone, or you know, on the rooftop. 
It's slightly breezy. The weather wasn't, uh, you know, bad because it, on Friday, rem- on Friday, yeah. remember how it was really pouring uh, that night, the last Thursday couple night. of nights, mm-hmm. and even Thursday morning when yeah. we were leaving the house, the, it was there. The street was kind of the sidewalk and street were a little flooded. Oh, from it was the soaked. Rain. Yeah. So uh, I'm hanging out. You know, I'm reaching out to my buddies, trying to find out what's going on, what time are they arriving. Uh, so one of the lizards who ended up in Miami, there were a couple of them who were coming from Miami. Their flight got canceled. And it was postponed to around 7 p.m. at night. So, you know, it was kind of unfortunate, but uh, one of them has a pad in Miami, so they ended up going over there. And uh, so I was expecting them later, but the other lizard who was flying in from Houston, um, you know, I was expecting him uh, sometime in the afternoon. So, you know, things are going normal. And uh, as, as, as we all know, that when you fly into Havana, uh, you know, taking like a connecting flight, oftentimes your luggage doesn't show up. So for for uh, Lizard Danny, his luggage did not show up. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously now he's at the airport. He used to, you know, for, ride. The, for the record, he yeah. flew United. He did fly United. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and, because he's not the only lizard on this trip yes. that United lost their luggage. Correct. Me, Gizmo, and Bam flew American all of our luggage made it, no problem. That's true. It's only the United flights. Only the United guys. So now his, you know, so you have to fill out a form and, uh, you know, they said they'll deliver it either by the next morning because the next uh, flight from Houston was the following morning. So we thought, all right. Anyway, so this lizard shows up. Now, the electricity hasn't come back yet. Now, this is kind of strange that it does go out for a couple of hours and then, you know, it's expected back. It's getting a little warm. You know, there's no water. So... You know, I wanted to go shower and, you know, just be ready so that by the time Liz Danny showed up, you know, we could hang out of bed and step out. And there's no water. So I said, all right, you know, the beer is getting warm. So now I'm on. <laughs> that, that's a big problem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, all right, you know, we'll make do. There's, there was a Havana club. I'm chilling over there. Liz Danny shows up. You know, we, we still grab another beer, a warm beer. We go up on top, you know, after he sees other pad and now your text messages start coming and you know they're talking about oh uh, you know there may be a crisis because all of uh, the electricity in all of cuba is out so i said oh all right um you know speaking to ivan <laughs> he's like oh the electricity will be back by around 4 p.m 5 p.m so we're like all right you know we are optimists at the end of the day you know we're on vacation relaxing so what we do is now, I haven't eaten anything all day because I didn't eat breakfast that morning. So I'm really hungry. Obviously, I've had a few beers in and uh, smoked a couple of cigars. And so as soon as Lizard Danny comes, you know, we have a drink and we say, let's, listen, let's step out. Let's grab something to eat. Now we go to uh, Parque Central. I said, let's go. That's grab- the hotel. Ho- yeah, hotel Parque hotel. Central. I said, let's begin. Let's smoke up there in the lounge. And then, you know, if we have to, we can find something to eat at the hotel itself. And when we reach there, th- so this is the second period, the realization, where you're really coming to a realization, something's going on. So we walk in, and they wouldn't let us into Parque Central. And they said, it's only for the guests of the hotel. So we're like, all right. So now, you know, this is... That's weird. It's yeah. the realization period. Like, all right, this is becoming a little more serious. Because for the listener, this hotel is always open to the public. Oh, yeah. Never an instance where you can't walk in that hotel. That's our home base. That's yeah, spot, for yeah. cigar smoking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of, anyway. Yeah. And a beautiful cigar lounge. I thought that'd be a great way to start, you know, uh, little Danny's uh, trip in Havana. So now we get a bit worried. I'm hungry. I said, all right, if they're not letting us in, let's try and grab something to eat. So we go to Cha Cha Cha. And George is out there. And now. Uh, so, know, George, just so, yeah, so, yeah, just so yeah. you know, for context for the listeners. Yeah. So, the restaurant Cha 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 is one of our favorites. I think the Senator uh, Lizard Henry and I were there probably three times. Bam, I think you went twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pagoda had come once with us when he had gotten there. It's one of the staples. It's sure. right across from the Museum of the Revolution. It's quite literally across the street mm-hmm. from the, the Grandma Boat. Conven- so, conveniently located. Yeah, it's very conveniently located, yeah. Central Havana. You can walk right there from Park It's about two blocks away. So, George, that, that you're mentioning is the very eccentric, amazing host 
maitre d', whatever word you want to use, just a fantastic guy. This, this guy, guy is fit for Hollywood. Yeah. Oh, oh, he's very friendly. Yeah, very kind. He's the Cuban Elvis. He just takes care of everything. He's awesome. That's great. So he comes <laughs> out, you know, he shakes hands. You know, it's a loud, you know how he is. He's yeah. so warm and welcoming and hugging. And I said, you know, uh, he introduces himself to Liz Danny. We said, all right. Uh, you know, we'd like a table for two. And uh, George says, oh, uh, really sorry to say that we're not serving any food, you know, because of the electricity, <clears throat> you know, they, you know, anything that's frozen or anything, they weren't just, they weren't serving at all. So, so at, at this point, does Lizard Danny start looking appetizing to you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I don't think he'd ever look appetizing. <laughs> <laughs> Have sorry. you seen Lizard Danny? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> He's a handsome boy. No, no, he's, he is. <laughs> but yeah, so now, you know, there's a little bit of worry that steps in, all right? So, so George, like, you know, it's it may be tough to find food, but he suggests, I said, can you suggest a place around? He suggests a place a couple of blocks in. So now we start walking in. Now now you're going to realize, you know, we are, everything's becoming a little more heightened in our, you know, in our brain. Like and the text messages are coming the in, The text right? messages are coming in. Everything's coming together. So this is the period of realization. And now you're going, so we start walking. And what, what we start noticing is there are a lot of people just hanging out on the streets. Because when there's no electricity, nobody's hanging out in their houses. So you see a lot of people, the locals are just hanging out in the streets and groups of people, and they're just hanging out over there. So now we walk in there and, you know, obviously there are people who are coming out, you know, asking for, uh, you know, some kind of assistance in whichever way, you know, we are walking by them and we try and look for this place three blocks away. We can't find it. So now we're like, all right, now it's started to get a bit dark. We're like, damn, if we don't find a place to eat, I haven't eaten anything all day. And this is getting a little worrisome. So we start walking back. Uh, we said, let's take the route back towards Park Central and we'll take a cab and we'll go back home. And then hopefully Yvonne will be able to set something. In the meantime, I reach out to a little Nino and, you know, reach out to him. He said, oh, church, church, church should be open. I said, you know, we had just uh, been there. So he says, all right, give me a sec. Let me find out what may be open around here. So we're trying to find out what's open there. This is a, this is a period of really trying, you know, to make sure that we have eaten something so that we can survive the night. So this is where we are. So just for the listeners, so Lizard Nino is important to the story. He's a, a friend of ours who lives in Havana, very resourceful guy, um, very successful, mm -hmm. kind of like um, just can make anything happen. Pretty well connected. Very well connected. Yep. You know, friend of ours, great guy. We've great, known him. Great IT guy. Great IT guy. <laughs> Rivals Gizmo sometimes. <laughs> Gizmo doesn't like you again, but no, wow. that's fine with it. <laughs> So that's important because uh, we'll we'll talk about Nino in a little bit. So continue. I'm sorry. So now what we do is we start walking, and so now we're going by by Cha Cha Cha. And I, you know, I recognized um, Carbone. I thought, oh, maybe Carbone was right by Al Cha Cha Carbone, Cha. Yeah. yeah, another restaurant. And, and so, and then Lizard Danny goes and he says, no, no, this it's a saloon. It's not a restaurant. You know, there's a saloon in the corner. So I said, no, it seems familiar. I, uh, Take a few steps back, and you can see their outdoor. You know they have the outdoor patio on top. So I said, "All right, let's let's just walk there." We went there, and all these, you know, all the servers, the waiters, everybody's just hanging out there outside. And so I said, uh, "Are you serving food?" And they said, "Yeah, come on in." We were so rellieved. We were so happy. It was you know the sense of jubilation from the <laughs> night before. When you get so excited, on, yeah. 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 So, you know, we sit down. What's great is that as soon as we sit down, um, you know, we said, do you have any kind of uh, cold beverage like uh, cerveza or something? So they said, yeah. They'd kept the uh, beer cold on ice. So they'd bring us cool cristal. Oh, it was so great. That's a lifesaver. I'll tell you. You talk about the relief and the oh, excitement yeah. and the, the happiness. Ne the nectar. Yeah, I'll tell you. It is. It was such a great moment. The beer was tasting so good. And, you know, when you go to an experience like that, you know, everything is enhanced. <laughs> you, you're just enjoying the drink. and You were ready to stay another two nights oh, without yeah. power. <laughs> at, at that point in time, you say, you know, you bought yourself more time. And, yeah, we ordered food, you know. Uh, so these guys at Carbone, 
even they didn't have any electricity but i think that some kind of a manual generator or something <laughs> there were like a couple of guys in the back they were going and then you would see the generator come up for like 10 15 minutes i don't know what they were doing but they did bring us some food prepared food so we thought all right wow. let's just grab this uh, to eat so it was uh, you know it was it was a really really good moment um um yeah and then after that now we are getting a bit worried because we walk out and so what so, ends up happening ho- is hold on hold on did yeah. i talk to you on the phone when you were eating at carbone because this was in your jubilation period where you seemed to have <laughs> no concern in the world we're so, we're, we're good we're good so we're panicking <laughs> and you're at dinner having cold beer celebrating no no so we, we spoke about half hour later because we we got back to okay, the house okay. so what happened is then we step out and then it's got to be hold on it's got to yeah. be pitch black outside it is dark yeah like there's and no lights there's no lights uh but you know we we just how how are you getting charged on your cell phone oh so my phone is just about dead it's got like 7% left but Danny uh little Danny his phone was working so you know we were walking down the street because just down the street is Parker Central and we walked there and we said at least we'll get cabs from there now you got to realize that it's getting dark the people all over the streets and there're not many cabs around like you're like all right what's going on and so we go to parker central fortunately there were two cabs you know they have those fancy cabs sitting right out over there but there was one regular cab out there and we just one of the guys comes and says you want a cab ride and we said yeah so anyway wow. we got home very fortunate yeah and so we ended up so now the thing to uh, inform even the listeners is that even during these periods the hotels not uh, the local hotels but all of the european hotels have generators so there's electricity in those particular hotels now that's a different story if you're not a re- resident or a guest you're not getting in uh but um you know we we go over there and we say all right let's go back home so now even you know when you're trying to get back in without in the dark you're trying to put the keys in it's an experience unbelievable everything Ugh. Because over where we stay, without light over there, it's dark. I mean, yes. it's dark. We're right on the Malacon. It's oh, yeah. residential. It's N- it's now, dark, dark, dark. Chef, if you're downtown Havana, and it's pitch black out, those roads are treacherous. And when you walk through that neighborhood where Al Carbona's were located, it's like a maze. Hmm. I can't imagine what it's like in there. It's got to be very, and very Lord creepy. No, Lord knows Pagoda had a ton of crystal. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh and a, yeah. And Havana Club. I'll take every so, cold beer you have here. He had that yeah. shit on IV, yeah, dude. Exactly. Right? So he's fucking blaming it on a lack of electricity. But no. We all know what the real problem was. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'll, I'll tell you, we did have uh, quite a few beers. It was, it was great. And yeah, it was so refreshing. It was... Uh, did you... Were you able to... Is it a situation where you could buy beers to take with you as well? No, Did we we had that? beers back home. No, no, we are still imagining the electricity would come back. Hopefully at night, maximum the next morning. Now for little Danny, what an introduction to Havana! By the way, I did yeah, use that's tough. I did use this is Havana, man. This is Havana. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you in Havana, man? <laughs> you in Havana, man? Cuba being Cuba, <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> so you're back at the house. You so now we're back, back at the house. We make it uh, all the way upstairs. You know, we said let's uh, uh, light up cigars, and you know, we pull out a Havana Seven, and uh, and and that's uh, you know, we're chilling, and that's when the phone call starts. So the funny part at this point, we're me, Gizmo, Bam, and Lizard Henry are in a car leaving Newark Airport, trying to get home, and. I look to see if there are flights operating the next day. Now online it's showing they are, but you know, who knows what the reality is if they can take off. So I call American Airlines and I'm like, "Can you be certain that the flight schedule for tomorrow morning are actually able to take off because there's no power in the entire country?" And we don't know. We're talking about this in the car. Mm-hmm. I'm driving senators and shotgun other guys are in the back. We're talking like You know, if the entire country's out, how much fuel do they have at the airport to keep the generators going? Is that going to go out tonight, tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, or can it last? Like, all these question marks are up in the air, and we're literally thinking like, he's there's a possibility stuck. he's going to be stuck there in this situation. Yeah, and we had no idea. We're, we're being jovial about it, yeah. but there was a general, like, a oh, serious yeah. sense in the car of like, we need to figure out how to get Pagoda out of there. So yeah. he calls American. Yeah. So the woman on the phone, she's like, everything I'm seeing. the all the flights are leaving they should get out tomorrow without a problem it seems the airport has power 
So at this point, I talked to Pagoda on the phone. <laughs> and Pagoda is, you know, having his Havana club, chilling on the roof with his cigar. <laughs> and he's like... Um, in the dark. In the dark. In the dark. And he's like, oh, you know, we're just going to you know, wait till the morning. And if the power comes on, we'll be okay. And, and if not, we'll just go to the airport. I'm like, but good, if you go to the airport tomorrow morning, there's going to be no flight to get on. Like, as people realize this is not coming on, every tourist is going to flee Havana. There are seats now on a 1030 flight and an 1145 a.m. flight. You need to change your flights and get on one of these two planes now to guarantee a seat. And it was just so he said, oh, yeah, I guess we'll do it. <laughs> then I talk to him. I get home like a few hours later, and he's like, there's this change fee that they're charging. And, <laughs> and, and he's like, my credit card's not working. And I'm like, you got to figure this out now. I'm like, use a VPN. Has to be booked tonight. There's no chance. And then Pagoda said, apparently, when he tried to book, like a bunch of the seats had sold it totally. even in that time. Oh, yeah. So, so, so now you could imagine, guess is reaching out to me. You know, senators reaching out to me. I'm like, you were All right, calm this is getting... and having fun, and they just no, no, no. So <laughs> they were, they... made you panic. They so fucked there it was, up. <laughs> there was a bit of worry, you know, when the hotel didn't let us in. There was a bit of worry when we realized that the restaurants are running out of food. So it's there in the back of your mind. So it's kind of fostering. Now, uh, the one thing I forgot to mention is my phone is dead. By the way, so we get into the cab. Fortunately, the cab driver had a, charge. a charger oh, wow. and an iPhone, so I was able to charge and. He, you know, he had a fast charger in that ride back home. I was juiced up to around 10% again. Mm. So I'm about 10%. I'm speaking to Senator on the phone. <laughs> no problem. I got 10%, like, guys. Oh, fine. I'm good. So let's, now, let's catch up. <laughs> so I'm, now, I go to, now I go to the app, trying to change the flight. I said, all right, let's change it. So little daddy changes his immediately. His phone's working. And there was no extra fee for him, so He's like, he was able to change shit. it. I'm, I'm out. out of here. I'm out of here. <laughs> Pagoda, I'm out. See you. <laughs> so, and uh, I'm over there. Now, like, this is where the panic starts, right? A little bit. What ends up happening is, so for me to change the flight, there was a fee. Now, for a fee, you have to pay by a card. And as you know, in Cuba, there's no American cards being accepted. So I'm like... Senator, I don't even know what the hell to do because I it's not accepting my card. And Lizard, I can't even use Lizard Danny's phone because he doesn't have a VPN. So fortunately, you reminded me, listen, make sure you get on the VPN. But we had already switched to uh, you know, the US of Miami, I think, uh, the on night the VPN, before yeah. for, for a different reason. So I said, all right. But so now what happens is when you go to uh, Cuba, what we typically do is we get a SIM card which gives us a Cuban number. Now, when the phone is off and you re, you know, you put it on again, you have to put the PIN number <laughs> to get back into the phone. Yeah. So for the listener out there, all Cuban SIM cards have a lock on them. So when the phone restarts, you have to put in a unique identifier four-digit PIN to reactivate the SIM. If you don't do that, your phone does not connect. Even if you have the plan and data, will not connect to the cell phone network without that pin. So this is where the paddock is, you know, on, right? I'm like, all right, I've got like very little juice left. I've got to go. Firstly, it didn't even hit me. And I'm like, why isn't this working? And then I see that, you know, the uh, I wasn't getting any kind of cellular network. I said, oh, damn, it's the sim. I said, oh, I need to find the pin. <laughs> now it's dark, mind you. We're on the rooftop. I have to go find my luggage, find the sim. I don't oh. know where it is. <laughs> A real MacGyver. <laughs> 10% on a phone or less. Yeah. Oh, so now, like, I go down, uh, you know, I figure it out, get the pen, you know, let the daddy is using his phone, the lights. <laughs> now, just imagine, we're, like, buzzing, smoking cigars. Oh, There's a little panic. It's Halfway dark. through a bottle of Havana Club. <laughs> and so we finally get the pen in, and, uh, you know, I, I was uh, eventually able to, um, you know, book a flight back. But it was what... What was really interesting is at that time, I think I'd spoken to Senator and there were like five seats available in the earlier flight around, you know, half 10 and all the seats were booked immediately. I said, oh my Lord, now people are bloody exiting the country. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, as, <laughs> as we I, predicted. I said, oh, I said, I have like very little juice left. I'm trying to book the thing. <laughs> it was like, and then I book it and I think I'm done. And then you know how it goes silent, like you have no idea till the indication comes on. Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn, did I book it or did I not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was it was just crazy. But you know, finally, it did give me the confirmation. I said, all right, now, oh. you know, we can relax. <laughs> now what? we could smoke and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> what was the rest of the night like? 
when when it went another hour, another two hours, another four, six, you're getting to late in the night. Power's not on. It's hot. Mosquitoes, et cetera. Like what? What is that feeling like? What? Like what is that? What's happening then? So so what started to happen? It, it's very breezy. You remember like it's getting to how it was the night before. It was slight drizzle. You know we were under the shed. Uh, you know on the rooftop we have a Havana. You, you know club. We we smoked cigars. So we just catching up and hanging out and smoked cigars. Or uh, actually, it, it got a bit breathy towards the towards a bit later because I think we finished a cigar. But we were very relieved once we'd booked because now we know that we had to go out. Um, you know, Ivan had come down. We had uh, arranged to go back with him. He was going to drive us back to the airport. So, so now we are set yeah. for tomorrow. Now it's just a matter of getting through the nine. And so, um, we you know we finished the bottle. You know now now we are like <laughs> we're on bottle number two. <laughs> now, now it's like he's pretty on, late. He's going through two bottles of Havana Seven, and the rest of us are on this chat on WhatsApp on pins and needles, full on panic, because we're seeing things that he's not seeing with a dead phone on correct the internet and we're and talking to other people. News yeah, I mean, is talking for context. I mean, this like made such big international news. Um, some of my business partners who don't follow news in Cuba at all, like most people, of course, wouldn't. I'm as I'm uh, landing in Newark, getting emails, text Me messages. Too. Are yep. you out of Cuba? Are yeah. you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Why would these people who never pay any attention to Cuba? That's true. why are they asking me this? And that's what I'm like, holy shit! Even here, yeah. it was all over the news. It was insane. Yeah, and over there, we're like, I'll tell you, ignorance is a bless. Um, so the next, so now we, it's so it starts to rain a little bit, and then it's very very breezy. Now. If we were to shut the doors, we'd you know it'd be really really hot. So we leave the doors open, and now a bit of the rain's coming in. You know the doors all over the place that they're hitting each other. There's crackling noises. So you're we're, we're so in the dark. Go to some survivor now. Yes, exactly. So you left your bedroom door open. Yeah. And did you open the windows? Oh, actually, uh, yeah, I opened the window in the back as well a little bit. Right? They had they have this. Actually, I moved to your room and uh, uh, the mm -hmm. guest room upstairs, and then. Uh, Danny was in, um, Lither Danny was in where uh, Lither Henry was staying. Got it. And so then we were right next to each other. So we, you know, we had that little terrace in between, but we were just hanging out for a yeah, bit. Yeah, there's like a shared oh, balcony. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. And then, so now we're trying to sleep, but it's loud and it's crackling. And now you could imagine this is all dark. It's pitch dark. It's pitch dark. Yeah. You know, there's some light coming from somewhere, you know, where there's some generator. Uh, but it's it's pretty dark and it's like a windy night with a little bit of rain and uh, it, it was interesting. I didn't sleep very well, of course. No. But, yeah, neither did we. No, but thank you guys. I'll tell you uh, for your support and you know even the advice and the conversations we had to try and get everything done and book the tickets. No, thank you, Senator. Thank you, guys. Thank you all, because you know you forget that sometimes like. It, it is the support of the community that helps you at least be aware of things, if nothing else. And then for us, uh, you, we are very grateful because you did get us out. We were able to inform the other two lizards not to come back in. So it kind of really worked. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you. That's important, too, to notice, even inside Cuba, for unfortunately for the, the Cuban citizens, if they don't have a working phone, they're not getting the text messages. The, you know, the, the, the national radio channel went down. Obviously, television's not working. So yeah. the communication about what's happening, what to do. I mean, every single human being on that island who's not a tourist is on their own, really. So a few friends that we met, a few of them messaged me. And I'm asking them, are you okay? What's happening at your houses? One in particular said that all of their food was spoiling. They didn't have the means to cook any of it because it was too dark. And... They had no security, so they were all terrified. So they're huddling together in one room, not knowing what to do. They can't go anywhere. Their phones were on and off. I can't imagine what that was like, dude. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying. You know, it's, it's, un, it's and, unbelievable. And we have to add context to the listeners who haven't been to Cuba or are not familiar uh, with Cuba with regards to the food, the food situation, which is really... The electricity is one component of this, but the trickle-down of that is the implication on the food supply. Which already well, hold on. What food supply? That's exactly right. it. Already in Cuba is fairly it's challenging rationed. at best. It's rationed, and it, even yeah. the ration at times doesn't exist. So, if you're so fortunate to have a refrigerator that has some food in it, a freezer that has some food in it, you might have spent 
months, weeks, however long, compiling that food for yourself and your family. And now all of a sudden you're into the next day, you're, you're moving into to 18, 24 hours. That food is going to start going bad. Right. And the, you can't just go to the store and get more. There is no store. Even if you have money, there's no store. You know, it's really important to think about for, you know, we're like I said, we're being jovial. This is what we do here. We're trying to create an entertaining program for our listeners out there. But you have to think how dire this situation can become as quickly as it as it did and has become for folks. Like it is a real real crisis don't forget about the hospitals yeah hospitals running out of power not just in the city but out in the provinces i read articles where they left patients in the dark they couldn't help them now if there's some patients that are in severe conditions god knows what happened to them yeah it's really tragic yeah. it, uh, to the, there's two things i do want to mention is that b- when the situation is happening when it's occurring you know we're we left carbon and we're walking by uh, back out towards uh, Park Central, you see people out there. There are all types of people. It's dark. You know, people are coming and asking you for, you know, some kind of assistance. And, you know, you just don't know what happens when in those moments. So there's a bit of, you know, we know that Cuba is uh, relatively one of the safer islands uh, in the Caribbean. So, I, you know, I just kept thinking about that. But having said that, you know, there is something in the back of your head that, hey, listen, you're going to watch. You know, you know, we've lived in New York and, uh, you know, we were in full alert zone. I'm not saying that we were, you know, just chilling and hanging out. We were in full alert zone. We knew exactly what we were going to do in terms of the next steps. We were looking for a cab. We were willing to pay more if a cab would have come and we would have just gone. We just needed to get back to the casa so that we're in a safe, secure environment. Mm-hmm. However dark it was, that was probably our safest place uh, after that we had taken care of at least a, a good meal at that point in time. So, uh, But the fear does start setting in. And then, you know, the conversation that night were very, very different. Uh, you know, when I was speaking to Lizard Danny, we were like, uh, all right, do we stay another day? Or, you know, what are the consequences of that? So, you know, you go through that, right? And it, it's interesting because these kind of situations in a place like Cuba could erupt, you know. Very the, quickly. The, very mm-hmm. quickly. Because that, that was our fear. That yeah. was our fear. That's right. And and because, you know, it is a revolutionary kind of, people are very intelligent, they're smart, you know, they are, you know, you've got to also realize that the generation who's experienced the first revolution is still alive. Some of them as grandparents, as, you know, uh, senior citizens. So there is that sense where, you know, these people are not, you know, just uh, laying back and, you know, if the minimum that what is being offered to them is being taken away, whether because of a natural disaster, it could lead to chaos. So, you know, that's when you really start thinking, now you're thinking like, there's a moment like Argo, you know, I need to better get out of this place and I'll take, yeah, w- yeah. whatever. And uh, no, thank you once again for making us realize that that was also happening and, you know, putting everything in context together was very, very important at that point. And and your point is is totally on the money as far as what our thinking was and what the reality is. Like, when you think about someone who's generous and kind, all those things, and the Cuban people are, this, you know, when you can't feed yourself, yeah. you can't feed your family, and even more so when you can't feed your children, all, every, all of that goes out the window. Yeah, all bets are off. All of that goes out the window. And that is the situation that the Cuban people have found themselves in, which is really terrifying. Yeah, it is. And it, it's, I, I, it's, it's so unbelievable to me that it's 20, you know, 2000, you know, 2024. And, and that's a reality happening 90 he, miles from our he, coast. He summed it up perfectly. The minimal that they've been given has been taken away. Exactly. What do you have left? And you know what? Even with that, he was able to experience some generous hospitality. That's true. At yeah. Carbone, and he was mm-hmm. able to have a meal and, and be goodness. welcome in. Yeah. And he yeah, can get so, home. Yeah. Shout out to the Cuban people for you know not not f- you know for remaining hospitable and being great during mm-hmm. a, what was clearly a tough time for them as well. So sa- Saturday morning, you are able to get to the airport. Get to the airport. What, now, what was that experience like? Oh, hot and humid. So they every the essentials were running TSA computers, etc. But there was no air conditioning. No air in conditioning. the terminals. There was uh, and it was Cuban getting TSA crowded. was operating. <laughs> 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 and CSA. <laughs> 
and and you know you be you know you go through that airport you're hanging out just to, to get through immigration for about an hour and you're standing in these lines with multiple people and <laughs> your um, your favorite place to be oh yeah <laughs> you love pressure <laughs> it's hot humid what, what sticky. was your what was your read on the other people trying to get out of havana did you what did you sense from them i, I think i think off the conversations i could hear with at least some of the tourists uh, a lot of the people were, uh, you know, exiting the country, meaning people, what had happened is I think I'd heard uh, somebody had driven all the way from the from the beach towns because over there, you know, they were in the beach town and the electricity had gone out and all these guys decided to leave immediately and they had come all the way uh, back, uh, to, back to the airport as yeah. well. So you you knew that at least there was a reasonable exodus taking place among the tourists for now. And you know, fortunately for us, and thanks uh, to you guys, um, you know, we, we were informed early. I was just a bit worried because if the power in the airport went out, uh, you know, it could be a disaster, which You're it done. did, by the way. Uh, so oh. fortunately, I was able to get on the plane and I left earlier, but let Danny's flight was a bit later. So he stayed on and the power went out. They were doing things manually. They were writing everyone's names oh. down. Holy cow. And you could imagine that those airports are crowded. And trying to do things manually to get them out. They have a difficult time uh, mm -hmm. enough yeah. when everything's working well, perfectly. Yeah. Nevertheless, when they're trying to find a pencil, yeah. you know, and a piece of paper, correct, would have been a great time to bring a lot of cigars back. <laughs> it, it would have been, it would have been. <laughs> well timed. <laughs> the scanners aren't working. Oh yeah, it would have been. Yeah, and you know, it's 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 really interesting because when you're making the decision whether you. Do you want to give it another day or no? You're saying, all right, but the rest of the place is going to be closed in any case. There's no food going to be available. Now, I do have to tell you, we hadn't showered for, like I hadn't showered for 24 hours at that point in time because there was no water. Bam, you, Bam had taken six showers in that same time period. That's exactly right. <laughs> you were not exaggerating. And I cleaned my shoes. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, unfortunately for Liz Danny, he missed his connecting flight by the time his flight took off. But so at least he, he got, out, he got yeah. out of Havana. Yeah, That's he good. got out of Havana. Yeah. And I, I, the one thing I can tell you is when you go through a situation like that and you come back home, I, so I landed in Miami, you know, I ended up at my buddy's place uh, over there for a couple of hours, it showered, relaxed. It felt so good. It's uh, a new sense of gratitude. Yeah. And, you know, it's you begin to appreciate, you know, this country so much. It is... You know, we take so many things for granted, so many things for granted. And yeah. I, I'll tell you, I, all I wanted to do was just come back home, sleep in my bed and just relax. And, you know, that's what I did following that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know every time I've gone to my refrigerator since, just thinking like what our friends in Havana are, and, and elsewhere in the country are going through. Sure. Even today, you know, Monday, uh, the power had been mm -hmm. back on for most of Havana. Not so much in the rest of the country, I think. And I, I, you know, we'll talk about this, but I think the blackouts and I think all of that's going to continue. I don't think that this is a, a real long term solution that they've found here. But, you know, you do have that sense of like, I've just been texting all of my, you know, all of our friends there for the last three days, just every few hours. How's things going? How are you doing? And, and to your point and what, what Ricky kind of pointed out, it, it's amazing to me that despite what they're going through, Despite the spoiling of food, despite the uncertainty, you know, they're trying to find clean water to, to drink for the next week just to be safe. Even still, the messages we get back are so generous. They're not complaining. They're asking how we are doing. How was your flight? How are things at home? Yeah, How's incredible. your family? Incredible. Like, imagine if like we were going through that here, like what the text messages would be like. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different mentality. And and I it I'm just amazed at how resilient the Cuban people are. And I do want to give a shout out to all of us to 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 us lizards, right? Thank you guys for as soon as they landed in Miami, you know, all the welcome messages. You do feel like you've arrived home, and I thank you all for the support uh, during the period because you know it's it's just a matter of like if if ignorance can be a bliss up to a certain point, right? If for whatever reason. If I know one of uh, the two of the lizards weren't able to make it because their flight was canceled, if lizard Danny wouldn't have come, then I might not have gone to downtown. I might not not have been able to charge my phone, and I'd have been there. You still went. It was there. it was it was so close. Yeah, it was so close mm -hmm. it, because without lizard Danny's phone, I, I don't think we'd have been able to communicate. 
It's true. My phone was dead. Yeah. And the thing about communication, I mean, my fear with the whole airline situation, when you're in Cuba, you have WhatsApp to make calls, but you can't make a call to a landline in the United States. So like if you're trying to call American Airlines or some airline to help fix your flight situation, you can't make that outgoing call from Cuba. Mm-mm. And so I'm sitting there like he if if the app is going to be a problem, he's screwed. There's one he can't call to actually verify that flights are going out the next day. Two, if he can't change that in the app quickly and he needs some kind of more advanced support, I mean, I'm going to be begging an American agent to let me change his thing on his behalf because there's no way for him to call someone out to be able to do that. I mean, it's just a different world when you're there. And I just think to Gizmo's point about the response of the people there, you realize this if you spend any significant time around the Cuban people. Um, and in a situation like this, the Cuban spirit is unbreakable. Like the, it, these these people there go through some of the most difficult and frustrating and miserable circumstances, yet somehow through all of it, maintain the same amazing values that we appreciate so much when we're there. And, you know, the sad reality is the same could not be said in this country. You know, we have some That's difficult right. situations and in many instances it brings out the worst in people. And the fact that that didn't happen there, that Pagoda didn't find himself in a situation where he was really, really concerned for his safety or there wasn't vandalism and riots in the streets like you see happen in yeah. our country here when the power goes out for an extended period of time in certain areas is just remarkable. Yeah, it's true. They've also been through this for how long now? 40 years? Yeah, even longer than that. Longer but this than is that. certainly but not like this. Not this like ex- this. This is an extenuating circumstance. That's absolutely true. And just one more thing to say: electricity is so important. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that's akin to oxygen oxidizing. <laughs> <It is>. <laughs> <laughs> electricity electrifies. <laughs> yeah, it does electrify. <laughs> electricity electrifies. No, but you can't do anything without it. In yeah. today's day and world, you can't do anything without it. It's, it's scary. It's true. And I mean, we were talking about this on the car ride coming back when we landed home. I mean, as we think about any future trips there, the the contingency planning, the the things that now we will need to be prepared for in a way that we've had so many successful trips without this level of challenge or difficulty, it's like a whole new mentality yeah. going there. Yeah. Yeah. And also the thing I've been thinking about in tandem with what you just said is how this changes our future visits in what we bring, you know, cause we all show up with a suitcase full of stuff to give away. And you know, the stuff we, we think we're bringing is, is makes a, a kid smile in toys or helps a school provide a better education with school supplies or, or medicines and all mm-hmm. those things. Now I'm thinking like, I'm going to load up a suitcase full of canned food. I'm going to load up a suitcase full of food that can't go bad if it's not refrigerated, that can sit on a shelf for 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's like uh, the change in my mentality and how we can, and listen, the contribution we can make is so minuscule, but we can only do so much, right? But it's totally changed my mentality and thinking about what I want to bring to hand out. Like I want to bring like Life Straws, that filter we found on, on Amazon that you can put any kind of water in there and it filters it and you can drink it. Like those kind of like rechargeable solar yeah. Yeah. flashlights e- uh, even you know? freeze-dried foods you know those those uh space foods you know you see oftentimes in gift shops and and like the planetarium or whatnot but freeze-dried foods are perfect for that they don't yeah. go bad they could you know maybe be rehydrated if you have a life straw which my wife gave me as a stocking stuff for a few years ago they're great um I'd never had to use it, but I did use it to see if it worked, and it worked well. All right, boys, so we're at the end of the second third here, coming to the last third on the Poor Laranyaga, Phoenix, the regional edition for Phoenicia. What's everybody thinking? Well, after Pagoda story, I feel like I can't complain about anything. So the cigar, <laughs> cigar is fucking fantastic. <laughs> it's a 10. <laughs> I don't think it's uh, amazing, but I'm enjoying the cigar. Yeah, it's not bad. It smokes great. Yeah, it's smoking really well. Performing very well. Construction's good. Yeah. Yeah, I think we were talking about the first third, end of the first third, going into the second, getting a little sweeter, and we were noticing some transitions. Um, I think, as you mentioned, it's kind of taking us on a journey. I think 
once we hit the beginning of the second third to the end, I'm, I'm, nothing's changed. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's consistent. And I, th- yep. I think the, the flavor profile is a little boring to me right now. I'm hoping the last third, something different happens. Um, but it's, it's the second third is just a lot of the same. Guys, do me a favor. Can you turn off the lights? <laughs> you want the pagoda experience? We don't yeah. have any Havana let's, Seven let's here. Let's see if it changes. Keep it jovial. If it, if it changes our our, our perception. Of oh, so uh, I do have to tell one more thing. So when I walked in to, <laughs> to immigration, you know, they didn't ask me anything. The guy just looked at me and let me in. I'm sure they were. They knew what was going on in. Or Cuba maybe you just looked super disheveled. They didn't want you near. The, <laughs> That's also possible. Near the table anymore. Like, just keep I, moving. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe he was like, "You stink. Just go." <laughs> <laughs> That's your first positive experience through U.S. That's, Customs That's in Miami. True. In Miami, yeah, it's yeah. good. So, boys, some other things we should talk about. So, we mentioned, you know, the resilience of the Cuban people. I just want to share some of the notes that we had gotten back, as I, you know, I was following up with some of our friends there. The one thing that really stuck with me uh, from a friend of ours there, she replied when I asked how her and her family were doing and her children, she replied, quote, everything will be fine as long as we pray. And I'm like, wow. In the face of all this, and she had told me that her entire refrigerator had gone bad. She wasn't able to go to work, didn't know when she was going to make any more money, didn't know when she was going to get food again was trying to, I, I mentioned it quickly before, was trying to find water for a week's worth of drinking water, was unsuccessful at this time, and still, everything will be fine as long as we pray. And I'm, I'm like, I, I don't understand it's that kind of mentality. It's impossible to calculate that level of uncertainty because we've never gone through it. Yeah, and it's to still have that staggering. positive. That's staggering. Yeah, It's incredible. Yeah. And like I said, asking how we're doing, how our families are, how our flights were, how Pagoda did getting out, it's just, it's incredible. So Pagoda mentioned Lizard Nino, who's one of the most resourceful guys. I would say as far as Cuban people we've met, he owns a few businesses. He definitely is, he has enough. He does very well for himself. And it really hit me when he said, uh, I guess he's probably around my age, like close to 40, maybe mid 30s. He said that it was the first time in his life that he had felt worried about food, his family in Holguin, and the chaos that might arise from people not having food. He said and it's the first time in his life this weekend that he was worried about any of that. His entire food supply spoiled. He had to throw everything out. He's in a neighborhood in Habana Vieja that people were starting to get a little crazy, yeah. rightfully, you know, of panic. Course. It's very tight in there. You know, there's these people live on top of each other in apartments and and situations that are really, really poor conditions, even when the lights are on Mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of food around. So to hear him say that, that also hit me like, here's someone that is doing well for himself and he's in the same position as everybody else. Obviously, if it comes to money, he's able to help himself a little more than others, but it's still pretty shocking to hear that. So let's talk about the electrical system what would happen because I found this really fascinating. You know, there was a lot of question marks as to what was going on. Did the grid just fail? And, and my feeling from, from seeing what came in on Thursday about the advanced shutdown of all this is the government knew this was coming and certainly seemed to me that it was a lack of fuel. They have old Russian, you know, uh, thermal, uh, thermoelectric power plants running on crude oil and coal. There's no nuclear, there's no, no. <laughs> water turbines. There, It's all powered by carbon. And they've just hit a point now in that country where they don't have a partner anywhere else in the world that is consistently able to supply them with fuel. No, because they China cut them off. They can't pay their bills. They can't pay their bills. China cut them off. They said, we will not be the sugar daddy for Cuba anymore. Russia's obviously distracted. Venezuela's got its own problems. Yeah, I mean, Venezuela's cut the supply of oil that they were providing by half. Right. How are you going to power the country? So Cuba does produce some crude oil, but I believe it's about 25% of what they actually consume uh, on a daily basis. So they're only able to provide one-fourth. So my sense here is that this is going to be a very long-term problem for Cubans, you know, and, and, and what it's going to, what it shows is they don't have fossil fuels in reserve. They don't. And they're burning through those reserves yeah. clearly at the airport and some of these hotels. It, that's clear that they don't have it. Usually in systems like this, they have to have a reserve in place. 
for an extended amount of time with the calculus that, okay, then we'll replenish and have enough fuel to re replenish our reserves and then give ourselves what we need for typical production. They don't have anything like that. It's irresponsible. It is the uncertainty, right? The uncertainty as to when the power grid will be back up, which causes the fear, right? It's when we started to feel uncertain, I think the fear started setting in us as well, right? Hey, what are the repercussions of this? And uh, it's a really interesting. I was speaking to Ivan about this, and Ivan himself said this is the first time in his lifetime that you know he's experienced such a situation. So um, you know, it's it's scary. There was a lot of uncertainty because this is for the first time they're experiencing power outage for so long, um, continuously. So, like I said, there were a lot of rumors going around as to what was happening, and actually, the Cuban government came out and admitted uh, this morning, this is, we're, again, we're recording Monday night, this morning, very early uh, on, on one of the official government publications, they said that the lack of fuel is the main cause of the problem of the national electric sy system. Of course, they then go into the political side where they blame it all on the U.S. blockade and the, the embargo and whatnot, but they're saying that about 900 megawatts cannot be produced by mobile and distributed generation due to the cause of lack of fuel. So there's just such a strain from demand on the electrical grid that I don't see without some serious intervention from someone, I don't see a sustainable plan here as far as the electrical grid no, being reliable. Did you hear the Cuban government's grand plan? They're like, oh, we're uh, we're building solar panels in Cuba. Oh, and they've lifted they, they've lifted the tariffs. The tariffs uh, on that. Oh, and they're yeah. like, and they're like, and they'll be built in 2026. So sure. what the hell are you going to do until? I mean, first of all, and, and solar cannot singularly power or even provide a majority of the power for the island of Cuba. That's correct. Let alone a bigger nation. That's correct. And they're talking about doing this in 2026. What the hell are they going to do now? You need a massive solar farm to power a small town, right? A small town. Imagine Havana and the rest of the island. It's not possible. Right. I'm not a political scientist, but the only way this is going to change if they make political concessions and change their trajectory and how they think, that's the only way this is going to change. Yeah. So I do want to say there was a, a, a member on FOH who posted a comment on the thread there that I've been a little active on from uh, one of the members there, TYS, and he said... Uh, that he's in the power generation business, and he says he can attest that a failing old system, which obviously the Cuban system is an old system, probably hasn't been updated at least since the 70s or 80s at you know at older, best, probably probably older. older mm -hmm. That uh, the failing old system combined with a complete blackout can be extremely hard to restore, even when fuel is not an issue. The starting current to restore a large portion of the grid is very tricky. I assume their grid and load dispatching systems are archaic to say the least. So even if everything is in place from a fuel standpoint, to get the you know, production up, to match demand, to get everything started again, it's just a, a, a colossal mm -hmm. undertaking that, that these people face. And they're just not ready to face it. Nope. The government's just not prepared to do it. And they've admitted it. You know, and that's why we're on day four now, going into when this episode come out, comes out, day five of people in Cuba being without electricity and, and food, which is, and water, you know, which I just, I can't even believe we're saying that in, in 2024. It's just absolutely crazy. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, boys, relevant obviously to what we do here is the cigar component of this, which I, I found interesting uh, that we were told from a close friend at the La Corona factory that there's no work or school, schools open in Havana until at least Thursday of this week and likely longer. So, you know, if you think about the people who work at those factories not able to earn their money, like all of these places are without electricity to power the refrigerators and freezers that are storing these cigars. The humidors are not running at these factories. I mean, they're essentially going to be idle probably for about a week's time. Do you remember the cold room we walked into at Iligido? Yes. That incredible stockpile worth how many hundreds of thousands of dollars? That's oh, millions. Millions. What happens with that? What happens with this Cuban cigar industry in totality right now? 
How's that going to change? And the last thing they need, you know, you talk about supply Can demand. Can you imagine? You, you were talking about refilling uh, the, the reserves of fuel. Yeah. Talk about the Cuban cigar industry and how they've still not caught up to what happened during COVID when they mm -hmm. were down. There's still so many shelves around the world in Europe, et cetera, that don't have any cigars. This oh, yeah. is only going to oh. add to that. I, how do you restart a factory when the people there don't have food to feed themselves or their children? Correct. And we're not talking about this from the perspective of, you know, uh, us being able to get cigars. No, the no, 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 no. The economic impact that this is going to have on that country and the people there is very significant. I mean, the government literally used the words that we have to paralyze the economy in order to try to reduce how much energy is being consumed to mitigate what's happening and mm -hmm. deal with this, but that there's no sustainable solution. They're never going to get to a point under the current way they're doing things where everything can be fully operational. I mean, even before this happened, every day we were there, they had to cut the power for hours at a time because they can't meet the demand. To use one of uh, Puba's terms, they're in a vortex and it's spiraling downward and I don't see a way out of it. And from a civilization standpoint, from the societal standpoint, I don't understand how you get people back to work if they're unable to feed themselves and their kids. Yeah. Let's say they had all the power they needed now to get back into business. Yeah. Your workforce is starving. Yeah. They haven't had water. They haven't bathed. You know, but it, it is these situations that lead to, you know, some kind of dramatic, like drastic change. Not dramatic, but drastic for sure. I mean, these could lead to revolutions or hopefully at least this is the time the government should think about opening up and, you know, moving away from, you know, their uh, ideologies mm -hmm. uh, into something a little more open and, you know, inviting a lot more capital in. Because yeah, they have millions of people who are or who are hungry. The one thing I will say I did learn today, right before we came on air, that El Ligito is one of the factories that has been running. El Ligito oh. does have uh, generators Generator. and solar. So I guess somehow really? they've prepared, and Legito actually has been producing, but all of the other ma mother factories in Havana, and I'm assuming all the provincials outside Havana, have not been operating And La since. Corona's closed. La Corona has been the closed. The largest factory in town. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I have for you guys, um, I'll start with this, is as far as advice for our listeners who have been planning travel, who are thinking about traveling to Cuba, even, you know, to bring stuff to give away, I mean, what what would your advice be right now to folks, even if the the electrical grid comes on a hundred percent tomorrow? What would your advice be? I don't learn think, swimming. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd be going to Cuba for quite a while. I agree. I think this is going to decimate the tourism of that country, which is we talked about this a few episodes ago when we talked about the sugar economy collapsing the tobacco challenges with the lack of investment in, in the tobacco industry, the fields, the farmers, and et cetera. <laughs> They've been relying almost entirely on tourism. Yeah, and let's say they do make an ideological change politically. That means they'll open their gates, right? What will happen? There'll be a mass exodus out of the country. Everyone wants to leave. The government wants to avoid that. So they want to keep their people, but they can't take care of their people. So my advice to anyone thinking about going to Cuba, anyone who has a trip booked at this time, I would certainly not be going to Cuba, especially if you have not been there before. If you've not been to Cuba, I, I would not advise going at least for the foreseeable future into the first quarter of next year. Folks who are well-seasoned travelers who, who are, you know, know what they're doing and, and maybe have some experience with things like this elsewhere in the world, potentially, but f I would advise any of our listeners that, Cuba is not the place to be going at this time, which I, I hate to say it. Yeah, I mean, this breaks my heart. That's why, you know, I've even been quiet for this part. It's just, I agree. If you've never been, there's absolutely, it is a bad idea to visit Cuba for the first time right now um, for the next several months until if there's any meaningful improvement that provides any ounce of hope that this would be navigable for someone who's never been. And I think even if you have been, um, you know, it's it, certainly any kind of extended stay or trip there is not advisable. I think if you've been many times and you want to kind of bring some stuff to help some folks out there, you would need to plan a short trip to be mm -hmm. able to do that 
and get out. Yeah, I also would think for the listener, tune into the podcast. We've developed friends and associates that we'll stay in touch with. So there'll be news over the next few weeks and months that we'll, I'm sure, disseminate, right? Yeah, and we'll, we'll share what we can. Yeah, yeah we'll learn and we'll yeah. disseminate that as it comes in. So listen to the podcast. And look, I, I haven't been and I, I wasn't there, obviously, but I would say if you are a little bit hard headed and, and insist on going, plan on giving more than you take. Always. That's yeah. All, yeah. yeah. That's always our mentality. And correct. Not, not yeah. more than ever. Yeah. And go there with a survival mentality. I mean, you, you, it, again, this for us is like the first time we've had to accept the reality that whenever it is that we feel safe to return, we are going to have to bring things and prepare for a worst case scenario where you don't have access to, to basic necessities like electricity, water, and all these other things. And so you've got to come extremely prepared if you're going to make that trip. So boys, before we came on air, j- right before we came on air, I saw an interesting news article that I don't know where this is going to go, but it's certainly worth mentioning that the White House has said that they are, quote, closely monitoring the blackouts in Cuba. And while the Cuban government hasn't asked the United States for support, this press secretary said that the Biden administration did not rule out sending assistance if they did. Mm-hmm. If they requested it. So they have to request it, and I'm sure there'd be some concessions or something that would happen there, but Biden is apparently willing to Mm -hmm. help support them, I'm assuming from a carbon standpoint, providing fuel or something. Yeah, I mean, none of this is rocket science. I mean, for the last several decades, it's been the case that if the government in Cuba is willing to humble itself to ask the United States for help and make some concessions to allow some freedom for these people there, not the regime that they've had to live under for decades in the way it operates where dissension is not allowed, there is no freedom of you know expression, all these things. All it would take is a phone call and some concessions that benefit the people there. The United States has always been willing to help. And the only reason that we've hit points where under the Obama administration, we finally changed our policy even without as many concessions as we would have liked, is because our isolationist policy toward Cuba hasn't changed anything meaningfully for the people there and the political situation. So, you know, if, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, it doesn't work. It's insanity to just continue it. So the, the reverse of that was to try to actually allow more American travel there, the people there, to really see and experience the freedoms that this country affords in hopes that they may someday be able to create their own destiny and meaningfully push back against the regime that's been oppressive for a very long time. So the sad part of what's happening now is all it would take is the Cuban government to finally admit they can't provide for their people and they need help. And that, guess what? Russia, who they allied themselves uh, themselves with, doesn't care and isn't helping them. China is done helping them. Venezuela can't provide what they need. And the only countries that can actually meaningfully help them are the countries that they rail against and capitalism is evil and all of this nonsense. And that's exactly who could help fix this for Right. Them. 90 miles offshore. Right. And if you talk to any Cuban national in that country, they love Americans and America. It is not the case like the propaganda the government puts That's out, true. like America's hate. That's, that couldn't be further from the truth. They blamed America for the electrical grid going down. Right. Let's just put it that way. It's ridiculous. It's, and, uh, you know, Pagoda said earlier, the Cuban people are very intelligent. No one there believes it. Correct. Everyone there wants the freedoms that this country affords, wants the opportunity, just the chance to chart their own course, not to be relegated to making 30 U.S. dollars a month having food rationed, being told they can't have electricity for hours on end during certain days. I mean, no one deserves to live that way. Their system does not work. Yeah, well said. It requires an ideological shift and a mindset and to reach out, make a fucking phone call. And and you know the other thing I was thinking about today, very much in line with what you're saying, I'm surprised and I hope it doesn't happen, but it's a very clear reality to me. I, I hope that they don't, decide to shut down the internet in Cuba because this in and out outside of Cuba or internally in Cuba, they've done it in the past where they shut the internet down. Propaganda control. Yeah. That would be a real issue. And I can see that being a a very real 
uh, possibility if you know these long extended blackouts continue because people are going to lose their minds rightfully if they're not able to feed their kids. What an episode, boys. It's intense. It's terribly unfortunate because we love Cuba so much. We love the people there. Yeah, I remember the second day I was there, I was just so happy. We were walking somewhere as a group. I felt it was an incredible feeling. I've been, that was my fifth or sixth time there. <clears throat> I just felt at home. I was so comfortable and it was a euphoric feeling for me, honestly, to be in Cuba. Always has been. And I hope in the future it will be again. It's unfortunate, too, because there's no, you know, it's like, well, how can you help? Like, there's no amount of money you could send any one person that's going to make a difference. They have nothing to buy. Yeah. Yep. But there are ways you can help. That's the only thing that, you know, it's like even the trip we took. I mean, I have zero regrets that this, uh, you know, unfortunately coincided with this disaster there in the sense that the stuff that we did and the things we were able to bring at this moment meant more now than it's ever meant any trip that we've taken. That's also any. true. It's not even close. You know, I didn't think it, about it like that. That's, that's also true. That's pretty powerful. As soon as I got home, I mean, the first, I, I could not have been more grateful that this trip was timed as this happened because these people now need every little thing we did or provided yep. more than they've ever since we've been going. Is there somewhere that you know of that we could maybe donate canned foods to or something? You can't where ship anything there. The problem, I think even DHL was one of the only providers shipping to Cuba. Obviously, you couldn't do it from the United States. That's not possible. I know that they were going from elsewhere. I think they stopped doing that about two months ago. I got to imagine these airlines flying in there with the potential that the fuel pump isn't going to work to put fuel back in the plane to get them back out. I mean, I got to imagine these airlines are thinking about it. We've seen so That's many airlines point. already stop point. traveling there prior to this. Oh. You know, Southwest, uh, JetBlue is out entirely. Southwest cut their routes down. United cut their routes down. I, I, I imagine American is doing okay for Miami because they're the only game in town. But, you know, I, I, I have to imagine the airlines are thinking about this going, we can't have planes and people and staff stuck in Havana. Yeah, it's a great point. And we're talking about Havana. We're not even talking about the rest, the rest of this massive island that is, I mean, Hurricane Oscar hit the very eastern part of, of the island, I think, earlier today. Thankfully, it, it didn't seem like it was as bad as it could have been. I think it went down from under a Category 1. But imagine these people out there with no communication, no power, no nothing, and all of a sudden a hurricane hits. It's just, it's un thinkable what what these folks are going through you know and and i just wish we could do more to help so i i do know that there are some services in in havana that people use that on the island you can send groceries and stuff but i got to imagine those are shut down now because how have they been able to keep their 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 food you know from going bad you know so that's that boys any listeners out there who have any questions uh about this for us or advice or if you're on the ground there in Havana or, or will be or have been recently and you want to add some context to the conversation, we will certainly be, be discussing this uh, in future episodes. Um, hopefully, this will find a resolution soon. I don't see it happening. I don't know how it's going to happen. But, you know, as, uh, as one of our friends said, <laughs> everything will be fine as long as we pray. I mean, <laughs> maybe we need to adopt that mentality and just hope for the best here for these people because it doesn't seem like there's any real action. All right, boys, we're coming to the end of our evening tonight with the Por Guaranyaga Phoenix, the regional edition for Phoenicia, and the G4 Blanco in Madeira. What's everybody thinking on the pairing? Pairing's great. Uh, I'm enjoying the pairing very much. But I tell you, tonight's not the night to shit on a Cuban cigar. <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to be honest. <laughs> I honestly, I, I, I did, I did enjoy the cigar despite, you know, obviously the conversation tonight doesn't lead to an elevated experience in, in our, in our pairing, but I thought the cigar was delicious. It wasn't the best cigar I've ever had, but I didn't hate it. It's probably the driest Cuban cigar I've ever had. I've never had a Cuban cigar like this at all. It's very different. Um, but that said, it was pretty smokable. I'm taking it down. I've got about an inch left. I'd say the combustion is amazing. Yeah. It's so it's the foggy well-made, and cloudy in this room. Right it's a now, well-made but, cigar. Yeah. It was very smokable. 
the flavor profile, I really can't pinpoint at this point what I'm getting. Um, yeah, kind of is what it is. Pretty much the same. I, I, I don't think it develops into anything more than what it was, I think, in the beginning of the second, uh, you know, second, third. Um, and uh, I was a bit distracted talking as well. So uh, having said that, yeah, nothing very special about the cigar for me. I mean, I'll just say, um, had we not had this robust conversation, I mean, I I would have been extremely frustrated with this cigar. For me, the last third, it, it heated up a bit, and I just, the flavor was muddled. Um, I didn't get a whole lot from it. Um, yeah, I, I didn't enjoy the cigar. The pairing, however, I thought the tequila was excellent. Yeah, agreed. And, yeah, the G4 is really good. Thankfully helped. It did. Yeah. This cigar, it wasn't as painful of an experience um, with the tequila. But um, yeah, I wouldn't pick this cigar up again. Yeah, and the first and second third, it it worked nicely. But the final third, without the spirit, it's fairly unsmokable. Right? So you, Do you really need, need some more. Yeah, we need some more. I, I would yeah. like a drop. Yes. Pass it down. All right, boys, it's time to move into the ratings tonight. First up is the G4 Tequila Blanco Madera. Is that, am I pronouncing that correctly, by the yeah, way? Perfect. All perfect. right. That's yeah. a shocker. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> like, Man, I, I just came from Cuba. I was trying to speak a little Spanish. What is this, trip number four to Cuba? For me, it was probably eight. Nine. Eight. Holy shit. Where have I been? <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, stick with those trips and uh, drop the Duolingo. You're doing better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bam Bam, you're up. Uh, I enjoyed this a lot. I'm, I'm at a nine here. I think this is a unique Blanco. It's unlike, like they like the cigar. It's unlike a lot of the other Blancos that we've had. Um, looking forward to getting a bottle of this for the fall and winter. I think it's spot on for me from time to time. Nine. Delicious. All right, Chef Ricky. Yeah, for me, it's a nine all day long. Um, viscous, complex. I love what they did. I love that they highlighted the fact that they're using, right? Because I, I think you guys have probably heard it from me in the past, and hopefully some listeners uh, remember. I'm obviously a big fan of uh, wood, you know, fermenting in wooden vats because wood's porous, flavors carry over, the yeasts get their do get to do their thing, uh, and it really adds to the complexity of the spirit as a whole. And I think they nailed it with this. It is a little bit hot. Uh, it's not the you know the the smoothest thing to drink, if you will, uh, but with some air and a little bit of uh, and the right moment, yeah, and the right moment, it's it's delicious. And uh, you know, I, I really encourage people to experience tequila this way, and and take note. You know, have to have an, have a regular G four, have this G four, have some other stainless steel fermented um, uh, tequila. And, you know, you, you really start to pick up the differences and the nuances um, and appreciate them. So, yeah, for me, it's a nine. All right, Pagoda. Uh, for me, it's an eight. Uh, the one thing I did like is that it was a little more viscous for a Blanco. Um, but having said that, you know, um, I think I mentioned it before. Not heavy into tequila, but the certain Blancos, which really, which I really enjoy, they have something very, very specific i like a lot of the fruitiness and you know where the flavor profile just lingers on your uh tongue for a bit longer uh you know i would rate those higher uh for me it's an eight so hold on so <laughs> <laughs> i think we're picking up on oh, the same thing there's three of us hold there's the fucking us. phone yeah. He, he's is that he's is giving that, this an eight as there's three ounces in his fucking glass. Is that right? your second pour? <laughs> Look at this guy's pour. Wow. Well, I, you know, hey, he's been through some stress. Yeah. That's a ten yeah. right there. That rain, he yeah. loves that Blanco. <laughs> Listen, for the <laughs> for the listener, Pagoda has. We all took a second pour. Pagoda has by far the biggest second pour no, in I, the I, entire I, room. I didn't even realize I poured this much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what world I'm Ignorance, <laughs> ignorance is a bliss. Okay. Hey, 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 listen, listen. You know, I'm an equal opportunity employer. I drink even shitty beer if it comes down to it. I've had just warm beer and come, so everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, uh, but yeah, this was wow, this is quite a bit. Anyone wants some? <laughs> <laughs> so for me it's a nine. I, I thought this was a really interesting, unique, different Blanco. I think whatever they're doing here with the wooden ferment fermentation vats as opposed to the stainless steel has made what I think is probably the most unique and odd 
Blanco that we've had. But as I always think about it, A, I would definitely drink this again. I think it paired very well with this Cuban cigar. I'm curious how it would do with other cigars. It kept my interest the entire night. I, I really liked the spirit. I didn't drink a lot of it. Obviously, we had a, a heavy discussion tonight, but um, I'm looking forward to having more, and I definitely will go out and buy it. I actually think at $76 for what this is and how different and unique it is, I think it's a very fair price for for what we had tonight. I, I was very happy with it. Yeah. So for me, it's a nine. Senator. Sir, I can barely see everybody in the room. It's I, very my eyes are here. burning. That's this true. is insane. <laughs> That's true. For all my frustration with the cigar, the combustion's an A+. Uh, the tequila, I'm in lockstep with most in the group. I think it's a nine. I think Bam's early call out of this being something to enjoy during the fall, I never associate a Blanco tequila with a fall or That's winter true. drink. Yeah. Yep. It's always a summer drink to me. Okay. This is the first Blanco that I would at all put in that category. And so I think they've done something really clever and interesting with that. I think, you know, having had the standard regular production G4 Blanco that I thought was outstanding, I'm not usually a huge fan of like these special releases. Like I think if you make a great Blanco, like just stick with that. You don't yeah. need all these different variations. And I feel like I'm sometimes disappointed, but this really worked well. I mean, A plus to them. Uh, they clearly know what they're doing. I think the body and complexity that this has for a Blanco is remarkable, yet it didn't overpower the cigar. So there's versatility in being able to pair this, I think, with a lot of different cigars. I mean, this to me could hold up with... Let's talk some, about that. Can we talk about that for a for moment? For sure. Yeah, I, I, I think this could hold up with many New World, even I agree. cigars, oh, yeah. Yeah. but also not you know totally overpower like a medium-bodied Cuban mm -hmm. like we're smoking tonight. So from a versatility standpoint, I think there's a lot there. And I think everybody's just said how unique what this delivers is. And I think that's what I'll always remember this for. And so for me, very deserving of a nine. All right, boys, that puts the formal liquor rating tonight on the G4 Tequila Blanco Madera at an 8.8. .8. I think score. that's a perfect good score for that. Yeah, score. yeah, yeah I think score. on Tequila Matchmaker, that's got a 90 across the board. Mm. So it actually, the uh, panel the panel and the user scores match, uh, and it's rare to see that on the app. So, yeah. That's this may be the first time that we're higher than them. Or <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. that they're higher than us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We'll give something a 95, and they're like at an 88. Mm-hmm. All right, boys, it's time now to move into the formal lizard rating tonight on the Por Lorniaga Phoenix, the Edicion Regional for Phoenicia. Senator, you're up. So I'm, I'm sorry to start this off because uh, I'm not going to be uh, all that kind to this cigar. For me, it's a six. Um, the price point is very high. This is not a, your run-of-the-mill Cuban cigar or any cigar. This is a premium price point and for me, therefore, needs to really deliver a premium experience. Um, there's nothing memorable about this cigar, which at that price point, I'd only, what did you say? This is 40. It was 48 when it came out on the secondary. It's about double that. Oh, Jesus. My Lord. So yeah. we're talking the price of the bottle. I mean, now yeah. I don't feel bad about my rating at all. <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, a hundred dollars for yeah, this. Crazy. I, 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 yeah. The only cigar <laughs> I would ever even think of picking up at a 50 or a hundred dollar price point is something that delivers a special experience for a special moment or occasion and this just doesn't do that i think that the flavor profile is very straightforward i would not call this a complex cigar i think there are ten dollar cigars that deliver more complexity than this does i agree um i think the one merit i'll definitely give it the combustion, combustion. is outrageous yep. i mean smoke filled room like few cigars are able to deliver the construction was actually very good. And I had no... there's only four of us smoking. That's right. <laughs> yeah, there's or only five, four five of us. Of, I'm sorry, five of us tonight. And yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine us. seven yeah. or eight. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> um, so construction A plus, um, combustion A plus, but the flavor, which is obviously the the biggest factor, uh, is just disappointing. I, I would have liked to have seen at some point the cigar get sweeter in a meaningful way, not just mm -hmm. slightly. Yeah. and have that last it's like it got a little sweeter when we hit the second third and then it went right back to being super dry and um just not delivering a whole lot so for those reasons it's not something i would recommend i think maybe if you love this marca and you love a woody 
earthy cigar that's very dry, then this is certainly up your alley. And there are guys and gals that do like that. For sure. Yeah. And then even for them, you know, my question is, but are you willing to pay 50 or $100 that's for that problem. experience? That's, right. that's the issue. And that's what I think that few people are or should ever have to. And so for those reasons, um, it's a six. Yeah. So I'm not going to be that harsh. I'm going to be at a seven. I think the cigar performed very well. I think the flavor it gave us tonight was very good. I, I, I didn't think it was great. It's not something I'm going to run out and buy at that price point, certainly. I think alongside some of the other large format uh, Cuban cigars that we've done, it's probably in the middle of the pack. You know, we've had hits and misses on the double Coronas and some other things. I, I enjoyed the cigar, especially in the second third. I know the tequila helped that a little bit. It enhanced it. Uh, the second third I thought was pretty good. The last third did get a little muddled, a little boring, but the cigar was still very smokable, enjoyable. I didn't want to put it down until I really finished it. I never even thought about putting it down, even as we were talking a lot. So uh, so for me, it's a seven. I think the value is is definitely not there in the cigar, so that has to affect it. Um, if this was a $25 cigar or a $20 cigar, I might bump it up to an eight, but it's just not there. Uh, so for me, it's a seven. Pagoda. Yeah, no, so I was uh, at a seven in the beginning of, uh, you know, the cigar. It it hasn't really developed into anything at all. Um, I was also a bit distracted, so I wasn't really focusing on it. But what I do like is, so my cigar is somewhat unraveling now, but what I did like about it was, uh, you know, the combustion, of course. Somewhat. Uh, Looks like a jackknife trailer <laughs> in the highway. <laughs> it's like talking to Pagoda during the fucking blackout. He's just sitting there, They're just somewhat unraveling. The country, somewhat in trouble. <laughs> Everything's okay. Everything's okay. It looks like a freaking a xenomorph. It looks like a, it looks <laughs> like the, a bottle inner mouth is coming out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, like I would not go and buy this at all. So I, I think it's a six for me. Okay, Chef Ricky. Yeah. Um, you know, the the second third, I I started to develop some hope and thinking that, all right, maybe it would shift over. And the tequila did help, but it really just regressed back to what we were getting on the first third. And uh it got it got very dry for me, a little sawdusty. Um, and there there wasn't a whole lot of change after. Uh so I was at a seven, but then Senator reminded me of the price point. So I gotta drop it to a six. <laughs> six. Yeah, the price point yeah. really kills. The price point is insane. Yeah. yeah. For sure. All right, Bam Bam. Yeah, I'm also at a six. Um, you know, the only thing memorable about this is that it's so unique, as I said earlier, to any other Cuban cigar that you'll have. The only merit is that there's an interesting saltiness to it that I kind of like, but it stops there. I, I At this point, I'm not sure what I'm getting. Yeah, even at the final third, that salt is just muddled into whatever yeah, else is happening. Yeah, exactly. Um, the the Really, my favorite part was that second third, that middle portion. It was fairly enjoyable but you couldn't really pick anything out six all right boys that puts the former lizard rating tonight on the port lauren yaga phoenix edition regional for Phoenicia at a 6.2 so we didn't have anything to compare the g4 blanco that was our first g4 at an 8.8 .8, but we do have four other port lauren yaga cigars to compare this 6.2 to the port lauren yaga petite corona on episode 34 scored an 8.4 the galanis on episode 88, scored a 6.0. The Monte Carlos on episode 123 scored a 7.5. And finally, the Picadores number one on episode 145 scored a 4.9. <sighs> not a Stella Marca. I remember. No, it's room. not doing well on the on the pod here. No. It's kind of a Hoyo category in yeah. a way. You know? Aside from that petite corona at any yep. point four. You know, I do wonder, I, I have a quick question for you guys after we've gone through our ratings here. Do you think that this cigar do you see potential here or no? <laughs> no. I sense that you don't. <laughs> but do you see with time that it could improve at all or or eliminate some of that muddling? I mean, it's really only a year old That's at true. this point, you know? Is Cuba's electricity crisis going to be solved <laughs> in a year's time? I mean, absolutely not. I don't see any yeah. significant potential for this cigar. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. You can be hopeful, but yeah. it's just not a great point. I mean, here. this also goes to, we've talked about this before, and I, I know I'm usually leading the crusade on this. I mean, it's a regional Yep. These regional cigars, nine times out of 10, are disappointments and they command a significant price point. Yeah. It's like you said earlier if you do your basic run well, stick to that. 
Right. Right. And if any of these regionals in, were in truly that great, do. they'd become part of the standard production. Right. Sure. There's no doubt. Right. Yeah, they'd move them over They're, quick. They want to make money. Yeah. And, 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 you know, to that point, so it's it's funny because this G4 is also sort of a limited release. Um but, you know, they didn't go the, the, you know, it's a Blanco, but even the Repo and the Añejos, they're not like gimmicky barrel releases where they took a barrel from a specific bourbon prior or whatnot and now they're labeling it that. Um, they just sort of went back to the old ways of doing things with using the wooden fermentation vats versus stainless steel. So they just heightened, you know, ele- you know slightly elevated the profile that you were already getting in a great spirit. Whereas here, I don't know what the hell happened. An unfortunate night tonight, boys, for the cigar. The tequila did well. The G4 Blanco Madera scored an 8.8. And again, the Poro Arnaga Phoenix Edición Regional Phoenicia scored a 6.2. Overall, a good night, boys. A uh, difficult discussion, of course. But one that had to be had. Had to be had, and, and we will continue to have it. It obviously won't be as timely as this episode, as we're, you know, we don't normally release an episode the day after we record it. Uh, but you know we will try to do our best to keep the situation updated and get unique information as it comes out of Cuba uh, to you. There obviously are some Cuban websites that you can find, some news sources that are not government-run that uh, that provide a pretty decent analysis of what's happening on the ground there. The one thing I will say for listeners, obviously you, you will notice we did not do a Lizard of the Week this week, given that we had a pretty heavy discussion and we didn't go through any listener emails. We'll save that for next week. But anybody out there who has any commentary on this, any thoughts, anything they want to share, any family there, friends, anything you want to talk about as it relates to this, we'd be happy to hear it and share it on a future episode. And of course, resuming again next week, someone is going to win listener of the week, lizard of the week. Uh, They're going to win some stuff from us. We'll be, uh, we're happy to hear from you. So please send us an email, a voice memo, comment on YouTube, Instagram, whatever it may be. We're happy to uh, share that. And, uh, of course. Oh, sorry, Pagoda, go ahead. No, no, uh, absolutely. I just wanted to uh, pass one uh, comment right before we, you know, uh, uh, finish this episode. You know, life is really a sum of experiences. And it's really interesting that I was able to experience this. And, uh, and it ended up being very positive, you know, from going through the emotions, you know, whether it was, you know, you begin to, uh, you know, realize that, you know, there's something happening. And then you go through, uh, you know, a little bit of, uh, the panic you go through, the happy meal moment where you know you've experienced it, and then when you come back home, there's a sense of relief. Uh, it has been a whirlwind of emotions in the last couple of days for sure. Uh, but you know, to the listener, the Cuban people are very resilient, and they're very happy, and they're very supportive. You know, but they do need to lead a very comfortable life as well. So do we all in today's day and age. And I think that you know, it's a call out to everybody, whoever can support. Uh, the people, right? You know, please do in whichever way you can. Uh, because after all, you know, this is uh, for a positive human experience as well. And, you know, I wish them the best and uh, um, um, I hope things improve there so that we all can visit Cuba in happier times. Yeah. Well said, Pagoda. Yes. Very well said. God bless the people of Cuba. All right, boys, a great night tonight again. Thanks, of course, to our listeners out there. Thanks to our sponsor, Fabrica 5. We really appreciate appreciate them. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for joining us. You can find our merch store and ratings archive at our brand new website, loungelizardspod.com. That's loungelizardspod.com. Don't forget to leave us a rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. If you have any comments, questions, if you want to reach out, say hello, tell us what you're smoking, email us hello at loungelizardspod.com you can also find us on instagram at loungelizardspod we really appreciate your time and we'll uh, we'll see you next week